Hello, my name is Kent Hovind. I was a high school science teacher for 15 years. Now, since 1989, I've been an evangelist operating the ministry Creation Science Evangelism and Dinosaur Adventureland in Pensacola, Florida. One of the great privileges of my uh, ministry is I get to do debates at universities against those who believe in the theory of evolution. What you're about to see is a debate that I did in Little Rock, Arkansas in the early spring of the year 2002. I would be honored to come do a debate at your university or against any number of professors at the same time. The object is to get the truth out to the kids. We want students to be taught the truth. Uh, we believe the scientific evidence indicates that God's Word is absolutely true, and we defend that against all comers. Hope you enjoyed this debate. We have an awful lot of other materials on creation evolution. You can get our catalog or call our website or call our office, and we'll be glad to send you information about the other materials we offer on this topic of creation evolution. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for coming out. Um, I, I have an announcement to make at, at the beginning, and Paul, I, I, I sort of apologize for not uh, for not telling you this sooner, but but it has it has to be said. Well, I, I was doing preparation for this debate and looking up various things and trying to come up with various arguments and counter arguments for the points that I knew or that I thought that uh, Dr. Hovind here would, would raise. And I started thinking about all of the, all of the arguments that he'd made in the previous uh, debate, all of the things that he'd said, all of the points that he'd brought up that I just found myself incapable of, of refuting, and I did a good deal of background digging into uh, the claims and the statements and the facts uh, that Dr. Hovind uh, presented, uh, thanks in part to his very excellent website, uh, www.drdino.com, uh, which I uh, can uh, highly recommend. And I started to think about the way I'd taught evolution in the past, about all of the students of mine, some of whom are here tonight, whom I'd bullied and brainwashed and intimidated and you know, generally tried to make feel bad because I couldn't get them to convert to my own particular mode of thinking. And I thought about the way that, it, you know, the, the senseless waste of taxpayer money for, for me to go in and act like an indoctrinator rather than an educator, and the way I've always insisted that my students accept this because it seems so right to me. Well, well, this is not particularly easy for me to say. It's not always easy to talk with your, with your foot this firmly uh, planted in, in one's mouth, uh, but I want to make a public promise right now. I really don't want to make this a typical adversarial name-calling, uh, angry, uh, mocking debate the way I sort of remember the last one as having been. What I'd like to do is make this a learning experience because from here on out, whenever I teach my evolution class, which I have to do because it's what they hired me for, I want to add a creation science section to it. And I want to learn about what it is I should be teaching, because I come from a very secular background. Thank you. Thank you, all of you. Well, thank you. Thank you. Still on? Great. Um, you know, the high school I went to was a public high school in, in Louisiana, great education capital of the world that it is. <laughs> mm -hmm. And things like this just weren't covered in um, uh, weren't weren't covered in, in my high school. I, one friend of mine was actually taken to after school detention for saying the name of Jesus out loud. Uh, that's what the atmosphere there was like. I kid you not. And uh, of course, in my, my college education, first at Tulane and then at the 
uh, the People's Republic of Berkeley, um, California, which is a little different from here, I might add. Just, just a touch. Uh, of course, I was not exposed to things like this. So the reason I came here was not so much to defend my own case, because evolution is far past anything that I could say to defend it. Uh, what I really would like to do here is learn some of the things that I should be teaching, some of the things I should be presenting, and the ways in which I should be presenting it, um, to make sure that all of my future classes are even and open-handed and non-intimidating to people of all persuasions who should happen to, uh, who should happen to take them. And so I really don't have anything else to say. I ended up not presenting a, a particularly strong defense. And I hope this doesn't um, upset the, uh, the presenters. We were told to make this a debate. So in my own uh, feeble way, I will uh, do my best to answer any points that uh, Dr. Uh, Hovind here uh, brings up. But what I would like to do, and what I hope some of you will do, is um, is simply to make this a learning experience for all, for us to learn about, um, well, in my case, learn about what I need to be covering better, which is, uh, which is the creation view. And I know that wasn't 15 minutes. Uh, this could mean we all get out of here a little early. Aw. All right. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I appreciate that. This is my 65th debate, and that's the first time I've had someone say they would like to be open-minded about it. And I really appreciate that. And I will come at my expense to speak to your class anytime you'd like, OK? Let me know. Here's my position. I believe in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. I believe he did it in six literal days, exactly like he told us in Exodus chapter 20, verse 11. I believe the world before the flood was very different. The people lived to be over 900 years old. I believe the word evolution is confusing to the kids because there are six different meanings or levels or stages to evolution, only one of which is really scientific. And here's where all of the confusion comes in. First, you'd have to have cosmic evolution. That would be the Big Bang. The origin of time, space, and matter is a complete mystery to scientists. And to include this as part of a science education is simply lying to the kids. Okay, We don't know how time, space, and matter came into being. If you have a theory about that, that's great. But don't teach it as if it's a fact, because the Big Bang is a far cry from a fact. Okay. Secondly, we'd have to have chemical evolution. According to the Big Bang Theory, hydrogen was produced. Well, how did we get all these other elements? There are 92 elements plus the synthetic ones. Thirdly, we'd have stellar or planetary evolution. No one's ever seen a star forming. We see stars blow up all the time. We never see one form. So that's not part of science to say stars evolved over millions of years. Nobody's ever observed that. That's not part of science. It's part of a religion that somebody believes in. Fourthly, we have organic evolution. That's the origin of life. No one has a clue how life can get started from non-living material. And it certainly has not been proven how it happened in the past. This also is not part of science. This is part of a religion and should not be taught at taxpayer expense in schools. Fifthly, we have macroevolution. That's where an animal changes from one kind of animal into another. No one has ever seen a dog produce a non-dog. All we see is dogs produce dogs. Now, you may get a big dog or a little dog, but you will always get a dog when you crossbreed dogs, OK? And probably the dog, the wolf, and the coyote had a common ancestor. I wouldn't argue about that. But a five-year-old kid knows they're the same kind of animal. Here we have a dog, a wolf, a coyote, and a banana. And I ask kids all the time, which one is not like the others? And every five-year-old gets it right. It's the banana, OK? The Bible says they will bring forth after their kind. So my position is very clearly. Variations within the original created kinds are all that we have ever seen and all that can be called science. Science deals with things we can observe and study and test and demonstrate. The first five stages that I shared with you are not science. They are a religion, plain and simple. Only number six is really scientific. Now, if you observe variations within the created kind and you say, OK, I think this variation might lead to bigger changes, OK, you're welcome to believe that. But that's where you just stepped out of science and went into your religion. You just went into the metaphysical. You think it might have happened long ago and far away. That's not science. Okay, That's a religion. My position is the evolution theory is not only stupid and an insult to our intelligence, it is dangerous. We are teaching the kids they're an animal, and then we wonder why they act like animals. This textbook says 30 million years ago, these creatures evolved. The earliest fossil apes that can be ancestral to both humans and modern apes. We teach the kids they're nothing but an ape. 
or an ape derived from the same ancestor as an ape, and then we wonder why they act like animals. You don't need to be a genius to figure this out, folks. What you believe determines how you behave. This textbook says you are an animal and share a common heritage with earthworms. Now, I don't care if somebody wants to believe that, but that's not science. And I resent paying for that to go into the textbook because that's not science. That's his religion. He believes we have a common ancestor with earthworms. He doesn't know that, okay? And textbooks are jam-packed full of stuff like this, propaganda to get the kids to believe this silly theory. We teach them they're an animal and they're acting like animals, okay? Go visit the schools and you'll see what I'm talking about. I taught for 15 years. Kids are being taught there's no such thing as a moral standard. I challenge people all over the world. I ask them the question, if evolution is true, how do we determine right from wrong? If evolution is true, what is sin? I'm telling you, there is no absolute standard to determine right from wrong if evolution is true. You just can't tell. My position is anyone who teaches this false religion and destroys the faith of students is in serious trouble when they face God because they're destroying their faith. Jesus said very clearly, Whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and he were drowned in the depth of the sea. Now, if you want to teach science, then teach science. But if you're going to mix your religion in with it and try to make the kids believe that they came from an ape-like ancestor, you better understand you're destroying somebody's faith and you're going to face God with this. You're going to be in serious trouble. I'm just here to warn you. I'm the messenger boy. My position is every one of us has broken God's commandments. God created this world and he owns it and everyone in this room, especially me, has broken God's laws. And we are in serious trouble. Nobody can get to heaven on their own merits. The Bible says, Thou art not a God that hath pleasure in wickedness, neither shall evil dwell with thee. If you have any sin in your life, you cannot go to heaven unless you have been forgiven. And 33 years ago yesterday, I asked the Lord to save me. And I'm going to heaven. It's not at all because I'm good. It's because I have been forgiven. Anyone who repents and asks for God's forgiveness shall be saved. And that's what I recommend everybody do. My position is very simple. Many people believe in evolution because they do not want to accept responsibility for answering to a creator. There's no scientific reason to accept this theory. But some people really like that theory because that's a logical way to get freedom from God. We were warned about this in Romans chapter 1 about people who would accept this theory. It says, even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. You ought to read the whole chapter about how the people descend into depravity because they're just looking for some way to get rid of God. They're going to be backbiters, haters of God, who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. The Bible says, for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. Evolution, at least the first five stages I shared with you, are indeed a lie in my opinion. There is no evidence to support evolution except things that are proven to be lies. This textbook just clearly shows the kids that the mammals, the birds, the crocodiles all have a common ancestor. Well, you are welcome to believe that, but don't call that science. That's a religion that some people believe in, but there's no scientific evidence that any animal has ever produced a different kind of animal. None, okay? This one says the coccyx, that's your tailbone, is a small bone at the end, end of the human vertebral column. It has no present function. That is simply a lie. If you're a medical doctor, you know there are nine muscles that attach to the tailbone without which you cannot perform some very valuable functions. I won't tell you what they all are, but trust me, you need those muscles. Your tailbone is not vestigial, okay? And I have a long time standing offer. If anybody ever tells you the tailbone is evidence for evolution because we don't need it anymore, you tell them, I will pay to have theirs removed. <laughs> Tell them, bend over. <laughs> this textbook says, many organisms retain traces of their evolutionary history. For example, the whale retains pelvic and leg bones as useless vestiges. Now, this is just simply a lie, okay? Those bones in the whale's abdomen are anchor points that muscles attach to, and without those specialized bones and those specialized muscles, the whales cannot reproduce. The male and female bones, are, are whales, have diff bones that are different. They're used for reproduction. It has nothing to do with walking on land. And so the guy who wrote this is either ignorant or he's lying to his students. But it's not true either way, okay? This one says the human embryo has gill slits. It shows the fish, the reptile, the bird, and the mammal having gills. This was proven wrong in 1874. This is a lie. This is not true, but it is still in a year 2000 textbook. Those little folds of skin on the embryo develop into bones in the ear and glands in the throat. They never have anything to do with breathing. 
I've seen folks that have five or six chins and they cannot breathe through any of them but the top one, okay? <laughs> My position is there is no scientific evidence to support the idea that we all came from a rock 4.6 billion years ago, which is precisely what evolution boils down to if you get rid of all the big words and the fluff and the feathers, okay? All evidence shown to kids in textbooks as evidence is for evolution has been proven wrong, gill slits, horse evolution, etc. Your kids are being lied to. My position is, if there is evidence for a theory, please show it to me. Just don't lie to the kids. There's an excellent book showing 15 of the known lies in the textbooks. I cover 28 of them on my videotape number 4 right there on the table, and my material is not copyrighted. So you uh, skeptics, if you want to buy my tapes, you can copy it, send it back, get your money back. Hey, you don't, but don't ask me to loan it to you, okay? That's my position. All right. My position is the citizens of Arkansas should pass and enforce legislation banning lies from textbooks and lying teachers from the classroom. Teachers who lie to students in order to get them to believe a theory should be fired immediately. They should get an honest job. <laughs> These six things that the Lord hate, a lying tongue. It's one of the things God hates, okay? The Bible says, all liars shall have their part in the lake, lake of fire, which burneth with fire and brimstone. This is the second death. So. My position is very simple. I like science. I'm not against science. I'm not against education. My mother retired from teaching public school. My brother's in his 34th year teaching school. There are many good godly teachers in the system. But folks, there is no evidence whatsoever for this theory of evolution that we're teaching our kids, and it's time we make the schools teach the truth. Now, if you, if you want them to believe you came from a rock, I can understand that, okay? And if you have some evidence for that, then please show it to me. But don't lie to the kids. And all we have so far, and I'll be covering that tonight at the church, or if you get my video number four, where we cover two and a half hours of lies in the textbooks, uh, you'll see some of the things that kids have to face every day, and they're going to face them tomorrow at the University of Central Arkansas in the textbooks. Bring me the biology textbooks in your high school or junior high or college here in this area. I will show you the pages that need to be torn out. It's very simple. I was in a debate a few months ago at the University of West Florida. And I mentioned if the textbook says the embryo has gill slits, cut the page out. It's not true. You don't need to buy a whole new book. The rest of the book's got a lot of good science in it. Just cut that page out. One professor got up and he said, I, I don't think we ought to deface textbooks. I said, sir, if you were teaching mathematics and you found a page that said 2 plus 2 is 5, what would you do? He said, I would tell the students to mark out the wrong answer and write in the correct answer. Oh, I said, you would deface a textbook? I said, now, sir, since you teach biology, if you come across the page that says the embryo has gill slits, and you know that idea was made up by Ernst Haeckel in 1869, it was proven wrong in 1874, he even held a trial at the University of Jena, he can he admitted he lied, he was fraud, okay? Would you have the students fix that page? He said, no. I said, then, sir, you are a hypocrite, and you ought to get an honest job picking peaches or changing tires, but you ought to quit lying to your kids in your classroom, okay? Jim Holt from... Uh, um, Springdale, Arkansas, up in that northeast, northwest Arkansas, and uh, Jim Bob Duger and I worked very hard to put together a bill last year that said the state of Arkansas will not use tax dollars to purchase materials that contain knowingly fraudulent information. It almost passed the representative, House Representatives, and we're going to try it again this year, and we're going to try it again every year until somebody gets the message. I want to go on record as saying I love science, I'm not anti-science, I'm not anti-schools. I just think the lies ought to be taken out of the books, and I don't know of anything to support the evolution theory. And I want to see the evidence so badly that we've been for about 10 years now offering a quarter million dollars if somebody's got some real scientific evidence for evolution. I want to see it real bad. Thank you so much. All right. Uh, yeah, and thank you very much. That was very um, uh, that was very informative. Um, incidentally, uh, I did a little uh, research on one of the matters you mentioned. Um, there is actually a website: uh, http colon double slash www dot coccyx dot com. C o c c y x. No, it's I think it's org, not com. Yeah, it's it's not a commercial uh, site. Uh, but it's a page put out with uh, information on an operation called uh, coccygectomy. It's uh, removal of the coccyx. Uh, it actually uh, was done to a, a friend of mine. 
a fellow uh, graduate student who had broken hers uh, during childbirth. And it's not particularly common surgery, uh, but, it, uh, uh, but it is done. Uh, there's a listing of a number of doctors who uh, perform it uh, usually as treatment for um, intractable pain, uh, pain that won't uh, uh, go away. Uh, so now that uh, you have this uh, offer that you'll pay to have uh, uh, someone's coccyx removed, uh, do you mind if I give your name and number to... Um... <laughs> All right, ask um, uh, the conditions called coccydynia. That's C-O-C-C-Y-D-Y-N-I-A. It's a medical condition where misalignment of the coccyx causes pain that can range from mild discomfort uh, to continuous agony. And... Um, the success rate is about 90%. It takes a while to recover, but people generally do get better. I think my friend's certain vital functions uh, ended up coming out um, unimpaired, although I didn't, I, I couldn't really ask uh, directly. You, you understand. I, I couldn't really, really ask that. All right. Um, I have a, a question now that's come up in, uh, uh, that's come up in, in my reading uh, all too often. Uh, we see illustrations of the evolutionary process as being uh, something like this. You have over on the left, you have Bonzo the chimp, and, and Oog the ape man is uh, over near there, and then you have uh, uh, Neanderthal and uh, Cro-Magnon and uh, some naked guy um, over, on the, um, uh, over on the right. And this picture of how evolution in general and human evolution uh, progresses has been attacked uh, very stridently by authors like Jonathan Wells, uh, as well as uh, other creationist authors, uh, going back to um, probably going back to George McCready Price in the 19, uh, 1920s. Well, I promise never to teach that human evolution happened this way. And when you get into the um, uh, when you read, as I have read, I have gone over to Central Baptist College Library and done some reading of the other side's position on uh, human uh, evolution. The creation literature talks a great deal about how all life is divided up into individually created kinds. And Dr. Hovind gave, Dr. Hovind gave a very fine example of, uh, of how these work. You can have a dog, a wolf, and a coyote. And sure, maybe there's been a little bit of change um, all three of those might have evolved from a common dog-like ancestor, but it was still a dog, uh, not a, um, a rutabaga or some such. And while you'll find, if you read the creation literature, that there's some debate as to exactly how you should define what a kind is, in most cases it's quite obvious. On the left you have uh, the skull of a chimp. Uh, on the right you have the skull of a human. And these clearly belong to different uh, created kinds. In fact, in case uh, any of the skeptics in here doubt my word, I brought a replica. Uh, this is not an, an actual skull. Actually, it is. This is uh, all that's left of the last person I caught cheating on one of my exams. <laughs> um, right here. And this, uh, this guy might have played uh, defensive backfield for a football team once. Actually, no, I take that back. Uh, this is a chimpanzee skull. Replica, again, we don't have actual uh, bone. And it's quite obvious that they're quite different. And, you know, there cannot be any missing links between them if, uh, uh, if the creationist view of human origins uh, is true. And there have been a number of fossils that have been found that have turned up in various parts in the world. Java Man, Lucy, Cro-Magnon, things like that. And if creation science is correct, and this, this is what puzzles me a little bit, there cannot be missing links between ape kind and mankind. Everything that we find must be either an ape or a human. And this has been the position of um, many of the, of the uh, authorities I've read, of people like Marvin Lubenow, whose book is um, available for purchase on Dr. Hoven's website, or uh, Jack Cuozzo, um, author of a very fine book that's also available uh, for purchase. But when I started looking into this, I started running into some difficulties. In the trade, we often refer to fossils by, by catalog numbers. Uh, so this is skull KNMER1470. 
looking a little stepped on, of course. I do hope I look that good in, um, in 6,000 years. And I'd like to uh, compare it with another skull, uh, skull ZKDE3, that was also found um, uh, quite some time ago. And as it happens, I have uh, replicas available of, uh, of both of these. The originals are um, carefully kept, uh, but replicas are generally available for study. And for the record, uh, this one at least I purchased with my own funds, so your tax dollars did not go into using this as an indoctrination tool. You're welcome. So if we compare these, uh, as you can, uh, as we know, they must be either clearly ape or clearly human. Uh, there was a, a uh, creationist writing in the 70s, it might have been Kelly Seagraves, I, I forget, uh, who mentioned that the more difficult it is to determine the boundaries between created kinds, the more evolution is going to look like as if it's true. So it should be obvious as to what is an ape and what is a man. If you purchase this uh, book by uh, Jack Cuozzo called uh, Buried Alive, uh, he is a, um, I believe is an orthodontist. He has a great deal of experience with skulls and with bones. And according to him, they're both essentially apes. They've got small brains. Uh, the one over on the left has a brain size of about 750 cubic centimeters. That's roughly half of your own. Uh, and he considers both of these to be basically funny-looking apes. Marvin Lubinow, on the other hand, uh, author of a book, Bones of Contention, uh, which is a uh, uh, very fine book, very fine review of the uh, fossil record, human fossil record, from a creationist viewpoint, uh, has placed both of these in as man. A uh, researcher by the name of A.W. Mellert uh, considers the one on the left, uh, KNMER1470, uh, to be an ape, and uh, the one on the right, uh, the ZKD skull, uh, to be a man. And uh, an author I've become familiar with on the net by the name of David uh, Menton uh, considers the one on the left uh, to be male, a man, and the one on the right uh, to be an ape. So I'm getting confused by this because I've read four well-accredited uh, creationist authors, four opinions that they have, and I get all four possible combinations of which one is an ape and which one is a man. Uh, if you read an essay by David Menton, a PhD scientist in Kansas City, Missouri, called The Scientific Evidence for the Origin of Man, very short essay, it says, there were only small eyebrow ridges, no crest, and a dome skull typical of a human. This is the one he's talking about. Indeed, it appeared to be a human skull. Walter Brown, on the other hand, whose book, uh, In the Beginning, is available for sale over there, on page 12, uh, states that this animal clearly had ape-like proportions and should never have been classified as man-like. Uh, so on Dr. Hovind's website, Martin, uh, he sells Martin Lubinow's book, who states that both skulls are human, and Jack Cuozzo's book, who says both are apes. Uh, now, I certainly believe in not exposing people to fraudulent information, uh, but the problem is either that one's incorrect, or that one's incorrect, or both of them are incorrect. At least one of these must contain false information and therefore should not be uh, placed into school libraries or used as discussion material um, in accordance with this uh, law in Arkansas that they're trying to get passed. So what I'd like to know is what are the criteria by which you can decide whether one of these skulls belong to a member of the ape kind or a member of uh, the man kind. And, um, what I'll do is um, I'm going to unclip this for a moment. I'll um, move these over here to your table because I'd like, uh, Dr. Hovind, if at all possible, uh, that you show me exactly what features there are that enable us to say uh, that such and such a fossil is an ape uh, or that such and such uh, is a man because I've been getting different answers from different uh, respected and credentialed writers in the scientific creation uh, field. I would very much like to know what I should be uh, teaching to my students uh, when they ask about this. They're a pretty smart crew. They've, they've, they've heard of these uh, skulls before. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Um, so I thank you very much. In just a minute, I'll uh, bring these over to your table. All right. The Bible says we are made in God's image. The textbooks teach the kids this is grandpa or something similar to this. We came from an ape-like ancestor. So what is the truth about the cavemen? Can an ape-like creature turn to a human? Uh, okay. Well, I guess that depends on what you mean by caveman. Okay, there are many people who live in caves. Okay, uh, Lot and his daughter lived in caves. Uh, Joshua hid, hid the, and the five kings hid in a cave. Osama bin Laden's the world's most wanted caveman, right now. Um, every one of the so-called cavemen that is mentioned in the books has been demonstrated to be wrong. Nebraska man, for instance, built from one tooth. Okay, later found to be the tooth of a pig. Uh, built down man, a deliberate fraud but it was in the textbooks for 40 years before it was proven that it was a fraud. Okay? Over 500 papers, some PhD papers even, were written uh, dissertations on the Piltdown Man and it was a deliberate lie. Neanderthal Man is still in textbooks today, yet it's been demonstrated years ago. Neanderthal Man is just an old man with arthritis, okay? which is why he was bent over. The brains of Neanderthals are 13% bigger than ours. Many, many Neanderthals have been found. They have average height of five foot nine, about the same as people today. Um, Dr. Coazzo, who's a friend of mine and is, is a dentist and had been studying what you said for 30 some years uh, on the growth of the human face, did a great study on this. The Neanderthals were probably people who were living post-flood, right after the flood, when people still lived to be 400 years old after the flood. Because the Bible says after the flood they lived to be 400 for a few generations and then 200 and then 100. The bones of your forehead never, actually the bones of your face, never stop growing. And so the Neanderthals are probably post-flood people who are living to be two or three hundred years old, I don't know, but they certainly are not uh, subhuman. Their brain capacity is bigger than ours, okay? And the eyebrow ridge is simply an indication of great age, probably several hundred years old. Cro-Magnon man, modern in every respect. Uh, Australopithecus africanus is still in textbooks today as used as evidence for evolution, yet in 1973 it was demonstrated it could not possibly be evidence for evolution. Um, Australopithecus afarensis, better known as Lucy, is in textbooks today. Lucy was three feet tall, found by Donald Johansson in 1974, Hadar Valley, Ethiopia. He said Lucy's becoming a human, particularly because of the knee joint. Well, the fact is there's quite a bit of controversy about that knee joint, and uh, that knee joint the one that was labeled Lucy's knee in National Geographic was not Lucy's knee. Yeah, that one was found a mile and a half away. So you need to get Tom Willis's website from csama.org, Creation Science Association of Mid-America in Kansas City, to get information about Lucy's knee joint. The femur was angled, and that was his evidence it's becoming a human. Well, the fact is monkeys that climb trees have angled femurs. Monkeys that walk on the ground have a straight femur. So it's not evidence. They all, the, the way they word it in the textbooks, though, is deceitful. It will say, it has ape-like features. <laughs> You've all got hair. That's an ape-like feature. <laughs> so is my dog, okay? They say Lucy's knee was slightly bigger than a regular ape. Doesn't prove a thing, okay? The bones of a Clydesdale are slightly bigger than a regular horse, okay? Doesn't prove it's becoming a truck. Um, St. Louis Zoo has human feet on their wax figure of Lucy at the St. Louis Zoo. It's up there today. Not one foot bone was found, and every other Australopithecine that has been found had curled toes. They were knuckle walkers. But the zoo director, Bruce Carr, was told about this. He said, look, what you have up here is a complete misrepresentation. It's a lie. He said, zoo officials have no plans to knuckle under. We cannot be updating every exhibit based on every new piece of evidence. We look at the overall exhibit and the impression it creates. We think the overall impression this exhibit creates is correct. In other words, Bruce is saying it's okay to lie to students that come to our zoo because we think the impression that man evolved from an ape-like ancestor is right. Therefore, even though our statue is a lie, we're going to keep it up here because of the impression it gives to the kids. Now that guy ought to find an honest job picking peaches, and somebody in Missouri ought to help him. He does, does no business being involved in lying to kids. Charles Oxnard spent 16 years studying every single bone of Lucy with a computer multivariant analysis. He said, Lucy is not a missing link. It's just an unusual monkey, that's all. And there might be some still alive today. So Lucy is not a missing link. Peking man, all evidence disappeared, but that was used as evidence for evolution for many years. And yet Peking man, what it amounted to was a bunch of monkey skulls that were smashed, found in a cave, and human tools found with them. So some brilliant guy in a government grant said, wow, this is, these monkeys are learning to use tools. Hello, somebody's using the tools on the monkeys, you know. 
Some people like to eat monkey brains, watch Indiana Jones, okay? They, they hid the fact that they found 10 human skulls, 10 human remains in the same cave. In the textbooks today is Homo erectus, which you referred to earlier, it used to be called Java Man, then changed the name to Pithecanthropus erectus, and now called Homo erectus, all the same creature. This was found, made from a few scraps of bone, in 1891 in Java, Indonesia, why it was called the Java Man, by a Dutch anatomist, Dr. Dubois. He had gone to Indonesia to look for missing links. He loved the evolution theory. He believed in evolution very strongly, so he's not an unbiased observer. Okay? He went to Indonesia to try to find a missing link. What he found was an ape's skull cap, three human teeth, and a thigh bone, which he found a year later, 50 feet away, and it was obviously from a human, and he informed the world he had found the missing link. He hid the fact that he found, two, he found a human skull in the same area, two, two human skulls in the same area. He put those skulls under his bed, under the floorboards, under his house. Kind of like Edgar Allan Poe, you know, the telltale heart. One of this was the telltale heads. He lied. And the fact that you're still using Java Man as evidence for evolution indicates you need to study this a little further. Dr. Dubois was a liar. Okay? There is no evidence of how man evolved, none whatsoever. Fossil evidence of human evolution is historic, in human evolution, evolutionary history <clears throat> is fragmentary and open to various interpretations. Fossil evidence of chimpanzee evolution is absent altogether. Nature Magazine, volume 412. Marvin Lubinow's book and uh, Coazzo's book, they may disagree on whether something is human or ape, but there's a much, much bigger point you are totally missing. I'll share it with you here. Absolutely no fossil could possibly prove evidence. It could not be used as evidence for evolution. If you walked into a court of law and said, Your Honor, this is the ancestor of humans today. Anybody with half a brain in their head would say, Your Honor, he can't prove this fossil had any kids. You certainly can't prove it had different kids. Why on earth would you think a bone you found in the dirt can do something animals today cannot do? Animals today produce the same kind. Why would you think it was different long ago and far away? That's my whole point. That is not science. That's a religion. Now, if you want to believe this is an ancestor of anybody, you can believe whatever you want, but that's not science, and it shouldn't be you, you shouldn't be using taxpayers' dollars to spread your religion in the public school system, plain and simple. Now, that's my point number one. No fossil, no fossil could possibly count as evidence for evolution. It, it couldn't count because you can't demonstrate it had any kids. And the fact that you find a bone in the dirt lower than some other bone you found in the dirt, that doesn't prove any relationship either. I mean, a freshman law student would have a heyday with evolution, disproving it. It'd be so simple in the average court of law. The problem is evolution doesn't have to be proven in a court of law. It only has to be made believable for students to come to school. And here's some student in the school who has a fear of his teacher because the teacher has an academic and a psychological advantage over him. And now he's going to be taught this stuff and he doesn't dare question it too loudly or it might affect his grade or his possibility for graduation. Secondly, I'd like to point out the similarities between these creatures, and there are many similarities, I'll be quick to agree, okay, I taught biology and anatomy for many years. There are thousands of similarities. The similarity demonstrates a common designer doesn't demonstrate a common ancestor. There's thousands of parts off a Chevy that'll fit, you know, off a Chevy Corvette that'll fit on a Chevy Lumina. Thousands of parts will interchange. That doesn't prove they're all evolving from a skateboard. They're all coming from General Motors. Hello? Okay. So the similarities you're finding in these skulls is just as much evidence for a common designer of these creatures. They have similarities like binocular vision, both eyes on the front of the head as opposed to the sides, because humans and chimpanzees have similar tasks to perform in life. They have to find their food, they have to find, see where they're going, they have to be able to do certain things. There are also thousands and thousands of differences between humans and chimpanzees. I mean thousands of differences. They'll say, people will say, well, you know, humans and chimps are 98.6% similar, or 98.4% similar is with current, uh, in, in their DNA structure. Well, first place, 1.6% of the DNA difference is an incredible amount of difference. The fellow who was in charge of the DNA uh, G genome project, or one of the top, I think he was in charge of it. I've got the information here if my computer didn't lock up on me. See, according to evolution, things get better automatically, you know. But I cannot get it to work for me. Um, the guy in charge of the, uh, uh, I'll get the quote here for you since I've got two minutes left. He said, um, this 1.6% difference is absolutely incredible amount of difference. It amounts to 48 million nucleotides that are different. And a difference of only three nucleotides is nearly always fatal to the organism. 
I know somebody's not going to believe me, so I'll show you where he said it himself. Human DNA is incredibly complex. Okay. I think I've got the quote right here. Let's see. Similarity in DNA. Here we go. Dr. Barney Maddox, the leading genetic genome researcher, said, concerning these genetic differences, now the genetic difference between human and his nearest relative, he's not a nearest relative, folks, but Barney believes he is, okay? I know a good job we can get for Barney, too. Um, he says, we're relative to the champion. He said, this is at least 1.6%. That doesn't sound like much, but calculated out, there's a gap of 48 million nucleotides, and a change of only three nucleotides is fatal to an animal. There is no possibility of change. So two major points I would like you to address. Number one, the similarities could just as easily be demonstration of common creator. Why aren't students taught that? Why are they only taught one religious viewpoint as opposed to all religious viewpoints? Secondly, the uh, so-called ancestors, no fossil would demonstrate evidence for evolution. Absolutely none. It couldn't count in a court of law. Because, as I said, you can't prove it had any kids. Why on earth would you think a bone you found in the dirt is evidence for evolution? It can't be. If evolution is really true, let's watch it happen. Let's see it. And the argument will be, well, it happened so slowly we can't see it. Okay, then it's not science. It's something you believe happened, but that's not demonstrable in a laboratory. It's not testable. It's not part of science. And I just, I, I resent them cutting down our perfectly good trees to print that stuff in a textbook. You know, where's Al Gore when you need him, okay? Um, so, my answer to your question is very simple. Yes, there are thousands of similarities. I don't know if this was a human or an ape. It doesn't matter. It, would, it wouldn't count as evidence for evolution because you couldn't prove it had any kids, okay? If there are species of extinct apes, and I'm sure there are thousands, you know, things that have gone extinct over the years. Thousands of animals have gone extinct. So what? That doesn't prove evolution either. That's the opposite of evolution. And so if you're using tax dollars to line these things up in your classroom and say, boys and girls, see, can't you see the similarity here? And some kid in your class says, uh, yes, teacher, doesn't this prove a common designer? You should say, well, you're right. It certainly could prove a common designer. We don't know. Why on earth are we discussing origins in science class anyway? Origins is not part of science. You, you're going to make somebody upset no matter which way you discuss it. Okay? Origins has no business being involved in, this, in the school system. It just shouldn't be discussed. Bigger question yet is, should we even have public schools? We'll get into that some other time. Thank you so much. The second question that we want to present to our debaters is, what is the origin and the age of the universe, and what is your method of determining it? And uh, Dr. Wagner, you will have uh, 17 minutes, and uh, Dr. Hovind, you will have 10. Sorry, this will take a second to get my um, monitor uh, working again. Well, I think I can, uh, let's see here. Uh, well, I think I can assure both uh, you, Dr. Hovind, and um, everyone here uh, that I will never again teach uh, about Nebraska Man and uh, Piltdown Man. Uh, those are permanently out of my lecture notes for all time. Um, thank you. Uh, right, and um, uh, yes, I did note uh, uh, Java Man, which of course was, um, you know, simply a, a, in the original find, it was a skull cap and a leg bone found from, uh, uh, found from, uh, uh, found a long distance away. Um, I do hope you will allow me to uh, mention the uh, Sangiran uh, two skull, uh, which turned up uh, in the, uh, I don't remember the exact date, I believe it was in the 1980s, uh, which is basically a skull with most of the face uh, still present. Um, I can drop Lucy if, uh, if you really think I should, uh, but a um, fossil found in a cave in South Africa called uh, Sterkfontein, uh, known as uh, Littlefoot, uh, has recently turned up, uh, which they are still getting out of the ground, but it appears to be a complete um, australopithecine. Um, if you'll let me teach about that, I, I suppose that's, that's uh, fair. Um, Neanderthals are old men with arthritis. Uh, yes, of course, the first complete Neanderthal skull found at a place in France called La Chapelle aux Saints uh, was definitely an old man who was stooped with uh, arthritis. Uh, the 
the baby Neanderthal skeletons that have turned up at a few locations in Europe probably weren't, uh, but I won't teach about those if you'd rather I not. I certainly don't want to upset, uh, um, upset anybody. Oh, incidentally, uh, this is um, a reconstruction of the skull of Peking Man. And you did mention that all ed evidence had uh, disappeared, so I guess I won't uh, teach about uh, Peking Man, except uh, the location was reopened in the 1970s. More bones have been found, and very similar bones to this have turned up elsewhere. Uh, so if um, uh, Arkansas law does not allow me to teach Peking Man, maybe it will allow me to teach about Yun Shai Man, for instance, uh, which is a, a substantially complete uh, skull. Uh, so thank you for giving such an excellent, uh, excellent, excellent answer to, uh, uh, to my, uh, my question. Uh, what I believe we're supposed to talk about now is uh, age of the, uh, of the Earth, and it is obviously between six and 10,000 years. That's what's printed in standard commentary on the King James. 6,000 plus a little bit was the age arrived at by, um, uh, by an Irish archbishop, uh, Archbishop Usher of Armagh uh, doing the calculations back in the uh, uh, 1500s. And I really don't want even to attempt to defend the idea that the Earth could possibly be old. Uh, what I do have, again, is another, um, an, another question that's been, been troubling me uh, a, a great deal uh, that comes from time that I've spent going out into the Mojave Desert of um, uh, southern Nevada, and uh, southeastern California. Uh, yes, the largest city in the Mojave Desert is uh, Las Vegas, uh, but there's, um, uh, there's nothing wrong with Las Vegas that couldn't be cured with a nice little fire and brimstone shower, if you ask me. Everything you've heard is true, but the surrounding regions are uh, quite nice. And uh, this right here is uh, Owens Lake, uh, California, just outside the small town of Independence. Uh, as seen from the, um, uh, that's probably the Inyo Mountains in the foreground with the Sierra Nevada uh, in the background. By the way, the Inyo Mountains have a uh, very steep uh, slope uh, that's nearly vertical, uh, that's um, affectionately known as the uh, Inyo Face. <laughs> Thanks, it was, it was a sympathy laugh, but I appreciate it anyhow. <laughs> right. Owens Lake used to be a lake. Uh, there used to be water in it. There used to be steamboat service across the lake, freighting uh, silver that was coming from the mines up in the mountains down to uh, the nearest town of uh, Independence, California. Owens Lake, unfortunately, dried up in the early 1900s. Uh, Los Angeles, the city, bought the rights to all of the streams and the springs that flowed into Owens Lake and kept it moist. Those have all been diverted into an aqueduct, and Owens Lake is now Owens Dry Lake, and it's visible as that white patch off in the, uh, in the distance. There is no more water except for a few days after the occasional rainstorm. What it's left behind is, well, what it's left behind is bad news for asthma sufferers because the dry dust on the uh, floor of the lake is now free to blow and uh, generally makes life rather miserable uh, when a windstorm comes through, as they often do out there. Uh, but most of the surface of the lake is made up of salt. When you get a lake that uh, is cut off from uh, flowing out to, um, uh, to another source, be it another lake or the ocean, uh, when that happens, there's nowhere for the water to go but through evaporation leaving salt behind. So a lake that cannot flow out will become increasingly salty, as we've seen happen in uh, the Dead Sea, for example, which has no outlet to, uh, uh, to the ocean. If you were to drive maybe 75, 100 miles, uh, you would come to a location called Badwater, uh, which happens to be uh, 279 feet below sea level. So I can say that visiting there was uh, definitely the low point of my career. It's the lowest spot in the Western Hemisphere. And it's what's left of another dried up desert lake. Uh, and we know this because, um, well, it was dry when uh, Europeans came through. But if memory serves, there have been some Native American artifacts that have been found on the shores uh, that include things like fish hooks and fish traps 
and things of that sort. So we know that there were people there at a time when Badwater was still an isolated uh, lake. And it apparently has grown extremely salty, saltier and saltier. The water has left. And we end up with a flat valley that is completely crusted with salt. That looks like snow. It isn't. Uh, and if you dig down, you get tens of feet of solid salt. Uh, this is not a very, very pleasant place to visit on hot days because the temperature has a way of going over 130 Fahrenheit. Um, you know how they say it's not the heat, it's the humidity? Folks, when it's 130 degrees, you don't care whether it's the humidity or not. And you'll find lots of other salt lakes out in the desert. They're known by the Spanish word playas. Uh, this is another one in Death Valley called the racetrack. And they're formed by isolated lakes drying up. And sometimes we're there to see it, sometimes we're not. Uh, but there have been instances where lakes have dried up in historical times. So we can observe the process that gives rise to, um, uh, to a thick bed of salt. Um, would I be allowed to teach this? Okay, okay I'm, all right, I'm, I'm, I'm good. In uh, the 1970s, a researcher by the name of Kenneth Shu and his team uh, started drilling in uh, the rocks that lie beneath the Mediterranean Sea. The Mediterranean is, of course, between Europe on the north and Asia on the south side and uh, the Holy Land uh, and its western border, eastern border, excuse me. And drilling in these rocks showed the existence of massive layers of salt. You penetrate down um, into the rocks that make up the bottom, you go down a little ways and you start hitting uh, very thick layers of salt, and you find other minerals that, uh, as far as I am aware, can only be produced by evaporation. Uh, calcium sulfate is one better known as gypsum, uh, perhaps better known as plaster of Paris. Uh, a sulfur-containing mineral called anhydrite uh, is also found in the Mediterranean Sea. There's a very good article on this in uh, Scientific American for the year 1972. And minerals like this have only been observed, as far as I know, uh, forming during the evaporation of water that is rich in minerals. Uh, and hydrite, in particular, this calcium sulfate form, only forms in water that is evaporating that's hotter than 95 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, so the water has to be just a bit, a bit less than body temperature for this mineral to form at all. And it has been observed forming in uh, desert lakes, in lakes called sabkas, uh, which are found in the Sahara and found in Saudi Arabia and found in other parts of the world as well. If the entire Mediterranean Sea were to dry up right now, uh, the estimate that I've got is for every 1,000 feet of water depth uh, should leave a layer of about 15 feet uh, of salt if you're evaporating from salty water. Uh, if the entire sea were to dry up right now, uh, it would leave a layer of salts a few hundred feet thick, and based on what we know on the physics of how evaporation works, it would take roughly a thousand years to dry up completely. Uh, it would not dry up um, overnight. What Dr. Schuss found, who led the team that did the drilling, found that the salt and evaporite layers in the rocks below the Mediterranean Sea were many thousands of feet thick. His interpretation, and of course he is an evil secular humanist, so you should take this with a grain of salt. Oh, did I just say that? I'm sorry, that was unintentional. His interpretation was that the Mediterranean Sea has dried up repeatedly and been refilled. Uh, even if you were to dry up all of the sea once and for all, it wouldn't leave uh, layers of salt and gypsum and anhydrite uh, thousands of uh, feet thick. And uh, his team and others have mapped the Mediterranean Sea floor. Uh, the black areas right there are areas where table salt, uh, the salt that you are familiar with um, in your salt shakers, uh, have been found. Uh, other minerals that are, as far as we know, formed only in evaporation, like gypsum and anhydrite, are found in other, uh, in other regions. And you'll notice that they extend all the way over Sorry, if the volume keeps going up and down, all the way over to the coast of ancient uh, Phoenicia and Judea, modern day Israel. If you take a, a boring instrument, 
me being a boring professor, I have plenty of those, uh, and drill down into the base of the Mediterranean Sea using essentially the same technology that's used in offshore drilling rigs, you can pull out uh, a circular cross-section of the layers of rock that you find once you get below, uh, below the water level. Uh, this is uh, t known as taking a core sample. It's a very standard procedure. And at two different places, uh, this is what you find. Uh, you find layers of sandstone, you find layers of a rock called diatomite, which I'll talk about in a moment, and you find several layers, four in the case of Greece, five in the case of Sicily, uh, of salt separated by other types of rock. The problem is this, there are staggering numbers of fossils that are mixed in with these beds. Now I am quite aware that fossils cannot ever provide any evidence whatsoever for evolution. The only thing a fossil can ever show you is that uh, something died, right? All right, that's what you taught me uh, last time. Uh, there are huge numbers of fossils of extinct life forms, things that we don't see now, that are mixed in with the salt beds. Some of these fossils are large, they are shells, mollusks, things like that. Others of them are microscopic in size. You're not likely to have heard of them, but people who do things like um, oil exploration will know of uh, these forms called foraminifera and ostracoda and things like that. Now we have huge numbers of fossils of things that we haven't found living today mixed in with these extremely thick salt beds, below them and above them. Um, one of Dr. Hovind's excellent online essays um, states that bent rock layers, fossil graveyards, and polystrata fossils are best explained by, uh, by a flood. Uh, I'd rather not talk about polystrata fossils and uh, bent rock layers just yet, although there are some very nice bent rock layers in the road cut of Interstate uh, 430, which is what I took to get here. But if fossil beds, rich in fossils of things that we no longer see alive, formed in the Great Flood, this must somehow mean that the salt beds did not form by evaporation. They must have formed uh, in a flood. They must have formed in a great inundation, a great deluge uh, of water, and they must have formed during the flood, but not during that entire time period. There must have been water in the Mediterranean before and after, or we wouldn't get fossils below and above the salt. Now, I can't find anything in, in Genesis that would, or wallowed, excuse me, bad spelling. I can't find anything in Genesis that would point to an event that would repeatedly dry out the Mediterranean Sea during the flood, and this bothers me a little bit, you wouldn't expect the Bible to have much to say about dry salt lakes in Nevada because, um, uh, well, because none of the action of the Bible takes place in uh, Nevada, at least not the parts that I've read so far. If the earth is about 6,000 year old and it takes about 1,000 years to dry up that much water, there simply hasn't been time for the sea to dry up and refill repeatedly. Um, a researcher at Oxford University has estimated that over a million years would be needed to produce all of the salt deposits that have been found so far. A million years of drying and then refilling. That works out quite nicely for evolutionists who can draw online long time scales of millions and millions of years. Uh, Dr. Hovind mentioned in one of the first sentences of his presentation that he believes in six literal days and a very short uh, time scale. Uh, so I confess myself to be stumped as to how you could get uh, that much salt under the floor of the Mediterranean Sea in a world that's, uh, that is 6,000 uh, years old. Uh, so I will go ahead and turn it over to, to you. There we go. All right. Well, um, there's an excellent article in uh, Walt Brown's book in the beginning. Have you seen that about the salt accumulation in the Dead Sea? There's also, it's on his website, creationscience.com. He's a PhD in physics, retired lieutenant colonel from the Air Force. Uh, let me give, answer the question here first. We're supposed to be debating on how old is the earth and what is my position? Why do I believe that? The Bible says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things were made by Him. Okay, God created everything. Jesus Christ is God Himself in the flesh. According to numerous scriptures, we can determine that. Jesus said the creation of Adam was the beginning. 
at the beginning he made them male and female. Mark 10, 6, from the beginning he made them male and female. So you need to understand, Dr. Wagner, your position that you're taking is calling Jesus a liar. Now, you're welcome to do that, okay, but you need to understand Jesus said the creation of Adam was the beginning, and I doubt that you believe that. So your position is directly at odds with what Jesus said, just so you understand. Okay. We'll give you a chance to respond in a minute. The Bible says death came because of sin. Nothing died until Adam sinned. Adam brought death into the world. The position that's taught in your school is that there was millions of years of death before man even came on the scene. So again, this is certainly calling scripture untrue, and you're welcome to believe that, but I don't think you ought to use tax dollars to do such a thing. That ought to be done in a private education, private institution, privately funded. The Bible says death came because of Adam. This is just what the Bible says, and the Bible says Adam was the first man. And Adam lived 130 years, and his son, his son lived 105 years, his son lived 90. You go through the Bible, you add up the dates, you get about 6,000. So I confess, one of my evidences for the earth being young is the scripture clearly teaches that, okay? But that is not all. There is overwhelming scientific evidence. Let me get my ocular enhancers installed. Um, I think there's overwhelming scientific evidence that the earth is young. In 1999, the newspapers announced the population of the earth has crossed the 6 billion mark. In 1985, there were 5 billion. 1977, there were 4 billion. 1800, there was 1 billion. Most folks agree there were about a billion people around 1800. You'll find very little arguments about this. And everybody agrees the world's population is growing rapidly. Nobody argues about that. Now, the population growth curve looks very clearly like the whole population started within a few thousand years ago. I would say it started when people got off the ark. Uh, eight people got off of Noah's ark, started having kids and grandkids and great-grandkids, and that's why we have the population today of six billion. If man had been here for three million years, we should have an enormous population now, somewhere around 150,000 people per square inch. The population of the earth is pretty clear evidence that man has not been here for millions of years. The moon is going around the earth, but as the moon goes around, it's gradually getting further away. We are slowly losing the moon, about three inches a year. I was just in Hawaii a few months ago, and I was up on top of the mountain where they have the big uh, uh, laboratory where they send a laser beam up, bounce it off the moon every few seconds to calculate the distance to the moon. Now, I know the moon isn't going in an oval, and it's, you know, it changes you know, throughout the month, but the overall pattern is expansion, and nobody argues with this, the moon is leaving us. That means the moon used to be closer. If you bring in the moon in closer, you get higher tides. It's a simple physics inverse square law. You bring it to one-third the distance, you flip over the one-third, and you get three, and you square it, and you get nine times the gravitational pull. When you run all the physics on it, like Walt Brown has done, who's a PhD in physics, and get his book in the beginning over here on the table, 1.2 billion years ago, the moon was whizzing around just above the surface of the Earth, which explains what happened to at least the tall dinosaurs. Now they got mooned. Oh. Um, you can use that one. No. The Earth's magnetic field is getting weaker. Since it's been studied, we've seen a 6% decline in the magnetic field in the last 150 years. Uh, the Earth's magnetic field is getting weaker, which of course means it can't be more than about 25,000 years old. And that also means carbon dating is not going to work because as the magnetic field declines, more radiation gets in and that increases the C14. We cover much more on that on video seven. I'll give you a couple of quick examples. The lower leg of a mammoth was carbon dated 15,000 years old, but the skin was 21,000 years old. One part of a mammoth is 29,000 years old, another part's 44,000 from the same animal. I give many examples on my website, including a long explanation of how carbon dating is supposed to work. And we'll cover that during Q&A if you'd like. Uh, much more of that in video number seven. The kids are taught, in order to answer this question about the magnetic field declining, they're taught the magnetic field is reversing. This is straight from a textbook saying there are reversed polarity. This is simply a lie. There is no reversed polarity in the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. What they discovered was areas of stronger and weaker magnetism. Somebody drew a line through the middle of the sine wave and called everything below average a reversal. Well, that's ridiculous. It's just below average. It's not a reversal, okay? There are no magnetic reversals in the ocean floor, only areas of stronger and weaker magnetism. There is no place where a north-seeking compass will point south, or vice versa, in the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. This is all part of a much bigger theory about Pangaea. They teach the kids that all the continents used to fit together in a big supercontinent. What they don't tell the kids is they shrank Africa around 40% in order to make them fit for the map. They also don't tell them they took out all of Mexico and Central America. Hey, senor, que pasa? Donde es Mexico? Panama, Costa Rica, Guatemala. Hmm. They also don't tell them the obvious. People say, do you think the continents were ever connected? They still are. What do you mean, were they? They always have been. <laughs> the low places are full of water, that's all. What do you think, it's hollow under the oceans or something? 
The shape of the continent is a pure coincidence based on the water level. Any kindergartner could figure that out. So yeah, the continents have always been connected, and they still are. They also don't tell them what anybody ought to be able to figure out by the time they're in third grade. If you take the water out of the oceans, you will notice there is dirt underneath. Okay? These continents are not lily pads floating around in a bathtub. Okay? So there is movement to the continents. I don't argue with that. I taught our science for years. I was just on top of the San Andreas Fault yesterday, speaking in California. Uh, there's no question the Earth's crust is moving some. No question. And when it moves, things fall down. But that doesn't prove this movement's been going on for millions of years. This is just much evidence of a flood. I cover many evidences that the Earth cannot be billions of years old on my seminar tape number one. I believe very sincerely the scientific evidence and the scripture certainly teaches this Earth is not billions of years old. It's only a few thousand years old. I don't know if I'm going to get time to cover everything you brought up here. As far as the... Um, oh, here we go. I do have it here. Uh, 226. The salts in the ocean today are 3.6%. 3.6% salt in the oceans. At the current rate of increasing salinity, because every time it rains, uh, groundwater runs into the ocean, bringing with it mineral salts of all sorts of various uh, flavors. The current uh, salinity in the ocean could have been reached in about 5,000 years. And um, the Mediterranean Sea, I don't know how many times it's evaporated. I cover in my video number six one of the possible explanations of how it was backfilled from the oceans filling in a little deeper. But you get higher salt concentrations. There are salt domes, like for instance in Grand Saline, Texas. You dig down into the ground a few feet and you hit pure salt. And you can they have bulldozers working underground digging out this salt, selling it over the world. Giant salt domes are found all over the world. And all you have to have is a stronger concentration of, of salt and you get much thicker evaporates. In uh, Alaska, no, I'm sorry, in uh, Lompoc, California, where I was uh, a couple months ago, they find uh, Diatomaceous earth, the diatoms you mentioned. Uh, diatomaceous earth is found in Lompoc, as a saving here. Lompoc, California, thousands of feet thick. And yet, all over the world, uh, when we find diatomaceous earth, there are very frequently found, what you mentioned that you didn't want to talk about, uh, polystrata fossils. For instance, whales uh, running through eight or ten feet of uh, diatomaceous earth. The kids are taught these layers are different ages. That simply is not logical. Polystrata fossils that he mentioned are trees that are extending up through vertical, vertically up through many layers of rock strata. Now the kids are taught in school, each of these layers is a different age. That simply isn't common sense. When you get a tree standing up running through multiple layers of rock, it cannot be that the layers are different ages. That tree is going to rot or fall down before a few million years is up. They're all over the place. I mean, many, many thousands of these have been discovered and they're just automatically ignored because the kids are taught these layers are different ages. In central Alabama, there's a huge coal field where there are hundreds of petrified trees standing up, running from one seam of coal right through the rock into the next seam of coal. It's called the Blue Creek and the, uh, and the Mary Lee Formation. These trees, when you put them all together, you'll find out that it's evidence that all those layers formed very quickly. I believe it's pretty obvious it formed during the flood. Cookville, Tennessee, they found hundreds of petrified trees, some over 30 feet tall, standing up. Now, if you want to believe those layers are different ages, you're welcome to believe that, but that's not common sense. Nor do I think it's fair to use tax dollars to spread that one religion when there are other ways to interpret this. Uh, sometimes the petrified trees are found upside down, running through multiple rock layers. So, my position is very simple. God's word uh, is true, and he said there was a worldwide flood about 4,400 years ago that completely covered the world. I don't know that I have all the mechanics of the flood uh, down. I don't, I'd like to see the video when I get to heaven and see exactly what all happened. But uh, the Bible says Noah was in the ark for 13 months. During that time, the crust of the earth is fluxing up and down. You would get evaporation and condensation and refilling and backfilling and all sorts of things happening. Plus, subterranean water coming out would be much hotter. Genesis chapter 7, the fountains of the deep broke open, in which case you get a much higher evaporation rate. It has to do with the latent heat of vaporization. If the water is already hotter, it evaporates much quicker. That's why you boil water to get rid of it. Thank you so much. The next question that we want to uh, propose to our debaters is how does your viewpoint affect behavior in society? And we would like for you to address the, uh, the question is, uh, does this represent a religion? And uh, we'll start with you, Dr. Wagner, once again. All right. Last year, uh, the state legislature of Arkansas considered uh, House Bill 2548 uh, at about this time. I believe that started going through in, in March, if memory serves. And there's one provision of this bill. It had you know, a great deal of, uh, of material in it, and I can't possibly summarize it all, 
but um, uh, this is one in particular. During classroom instruction conducted by state agencies, museums, zoos, public schools, and political subdivisions of the state, <gasps> When any statement in instructional material is identified by the instructor to be a theory, the instructor shall instruct the class to make a marginal notation uh, that the statement is a theory. And I believe this stems from the deep-rooted impulse of uh, the authors and sponsors of this bill to improve accuracy in uh, our textbooks and our educational uh, institutions. Uh, if something has not been proven, it should not be presented as proven. I am 100% in favor of that. And it's not just the theory of evolution that is being taught as fact all over Arkansas. There are theories being taught as if they were fact in the state of Arkansas, the extent of which will shock you. I recently went through the library of the University of Central Arkansas with all of those books, all 350,000 of them or so, uh, purchased at taxpayer expense and was astonished at what I found at the enormous range of theories of unproven assertions that are being taught as if they were simple facts. And it victimizes everyone, folks. I'll demonstrate. Leaving the question of evolution aside, they are teaching the unproved notion that all life is made of cells. This is called the cell theory. It was come up with by um, two German botanists named uh, Matthias Schleiden and Theodor Schwann in 1841. But it's only a theory. It has not been absolutely proven. And yet the medical students in our University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences are being victimized by being taught only the cell theory and not alternatives. Shut up. <laughs> You'll find references in these books, in our, in our textbooks, and our, our library books, to the germ theory of disease concocted by Louis Pasteur and Robert Koch. This is the unproved notion that microscopic bacteria, which you can't actually see with your unaided eye, can make you sick. And it's labeled as such in the textbooks and in the reference books that we deal with. It is only a theory, it is not proven, that opening unmarked envelopes sent to you and breathing in white powder that you find is actually bad for you. We cannot offer scientific proof of this. If Dr. Hovind were to offer $250,000 for proof of the germ theory, he'd be able to hang on to his money for a very long time. There's also the heliocentric theory, going back to the 1600s, uh, the theory of Copernicus. It's the unproved notion that the Earth goes around the sun and that it spins while it's doing so. And it's not only unproved, it's unbiblical. Uh, Dr. Hovind, um, you mentioned earlier that the Earth was spinning over 1,000 miles per hour at the equator, if I uh, wrote that down correctly. Uh, there is a verse in the Psalms, I believe it's Psalm 91, that says, the Earth also is established, therefore it shall not be moved. Uh, clearly you were calling King David a liar. And your tax dollars are being used to defend this preposterous notion that the Earth actually goes around the sun and that it's round. There is actually a group of biblical flat earthers based out of Lancaster, California, with some very interesting information on the web. And this is not being presented in our astronomy classes. There's more. There is this unproved notion called electromagnetic theory that is being taught as if it were fact to our engineers and our physicists and our electronics technicians that supposedly explains electricity and magnetism. But it's only a theory. I did some reading in engineering textbooks. It penetrated even there. You will find references in these textbooks to plasticity theory. This is only a theory. It is not proved that metals bend in a particular way when you put weight on them. And finally, the atomic theory, the utterly unproved notion, which a number of prominent physicists like the German Ernst Mach have disagreed with, that everything is made up of some sort of invisible atoms that you can't actually see. Our architects and our engineers are being victimized by only being taught one version, by not being allowed to, by being forced to use plasticity theory, by being forced to use this mechanical, unproven notion uh, when they design bridges and buildings uh, for the very picayune reason that the bridges and buildings would fall down if they didn't. That's not good enough reason. We need to expose them to a wide range. Just an example, a so-called educational website on disease. Clearly, 
mentions the germ theory of disease. Not proven, not fact, merely a theory. Yet our medical schools indoctrinate thousands of doctors each year with the unproven notion that little living things crawling around in the air can make you ill. Germ theory, germ theory. A common biology textbook, Life, the Science of Biology, calls this the fourth organizing concept in all of biology, but it's only a theory. It's the cell theory. The notion that organisms are composed of cells and that the cell is therefore the basic building block of life. We need to present a wider range of alternatives. A very common astronomy textbook, the heliocentric theory, the idea Copernicus came up with. The new theory was supported at the outset by no convincing proof. And if they have proved it, why are they still referring to it as the heliocentric theory? I would really like to know. Common physical, physics reference. We got this out of their library. It's a whole book called Theoretical Physics. Not practical physics, not the sort of thing people would use. It talks about the theory of the electromagnetic field, this unproven notion of a bunch of numbers and symbols and equations uh, that I couldn't understand that allegedly explain what's going on in my computer right now. Why are we teaching them only this? Theory of relativity I don't even want to go into. Common engineering textbook, we find again, the theory of plasticity, dislocation theory. There's a close up if you couldn't see the original, the theory of initial and continued yielding. All of these ways for building solid bridges and solid buildings are being presented as if they were fact, but it's clear from the textbooks that I have seen in the library that, they're being, uh, that they, what they really are is unproven speculation. They are religions. We are indoctrinating our doctors with the religion that bacteria creep around in the air. So Dr. Hovind, I think I fundamentally agree with you about the impact that evolution has had on society, but it has its tentacles in areas much farther than just biology. Our society is being eroded at the core from the widespread acceptance of unproven theories in everything from building design, bridge design, aircraft design, uh, to physics and to chemistry. And I say, I agree, we should tear all of these pages out and remove all of these books from our libraries and do nothing whatsoever but teach facts. Thank you very much. All right. Um, I, don't, I can't remember the name of the fallacy for what you just committed for the logical thinking, but you're trying to include evolution with these other things as it, to try to make it appear that they're the same. I'll have to go back and look up the name of the fallacy in the, in the logical process. Um, but we observe cells. To say the cell theory, I mean, you can see them under the microscope. I've seen them and worked on them many thousands of times. You can see the effects of the electromagnetic theory. You can see the results. I would like to see what results we have from the evolution theory. What advancements to modern science do we have? What good has this done? And I think I could point out, if we had time, scores of examples where the textbooks do not refer to it as the evolution theory. They refer to it as the fact of evolution. And they'll say statements like, you know, all species of life have a common ancestor. That has not been observed. It's not even said that this is a theory that all species of life have a common ancestor. So you're trying to include evolution with these other sciences as if they're on equal footing when they're certainly not at all. Uh, let me give you some examples of what this theory has done for our, our world. Um, evolution is the foundation philosophy behind racism. There are many, many folks who would agree with this, including Stephen Gould. Dar there's Darwin's book, The Origin of Species, which is, by the way, not the entire title to the book. Um, this, these are considered different species of monkeys, yet they're obviously the same kind of animal. Okay, they're still a monkey. Here's a little more to the title. In a book entitled, On the Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection, well, now wait a minute, there's more to the title than that. Here's the whole title of Darwin's book. But the origin of species by means of natural selection or the preservation of favored races in the struggle for life. Darwin was quite a racist. This is well known. All you gotta do is read any of his books. He thought natives were advanced animals. He thought the way we get higher animals, notice the phrase higher animals, in other words, uh, one's lower than the other, okay, from Darwin's book. Of course, in 1859, racism was prevalent in, in America, certainly, and still a lot of slavery in the world today. Um, but uh, slavery was common. Henry Fairfield Osborne, who testified at the uh, Scopes Monkey Trial, 1925, Dayton, Tennessee, 
he was the uh, curator at the American Museum of Natural History, he said, the standard of intelligence of the average adult Negro is similar to that of the 11-year-old youth of the species Homo sapien. He was quite the racist. Stephen Gould at Harvard University said, biological arguments for racism may have been common before 1850, but they increased by orders of magnitude following the acceptance of the evolutionary theory. So I think this theory we're teaching the kids certainly is a just pseudo-scientific justification for racism. Thomas Huxley, the man who really promoted Darwin, said, no rational man cognizant of the facts believes the average Negro is the equal, still less the superior, of the white man. Uh, King, uh, Priestley, King, Charles, uh, Priestley, Charles Kingley, there it is, was the Anglican priest who said this, uh, the black people of Australia, exactly the same race as the African Negro, cannot take in the gospel. Poor brutes in human shape, they must perish off the face of the earth. Kingsley is the fellow who really promoted Darwin and got people to accept him. Kingsley and Huxley were the two primary pushers and movers and shakers for Darwin's theory when it came out. Uh, the Mormons, of course, have swallowed this, and they think the Negroes are inferior. We could talk a long time about that if we had time. Um, so I, I would point out that uh, the evolutionary theory was used as justification for killing the uh, Australian and the uh, Tasmanian Aborigines. They were using the skulls of these people as displays in museums and in classrooms because their jaws are thicker. People used to go to Australia and kill the Aborigines just to get their skulls for displays. The jaws are thicker because they use their jaws more, and any bodybuilder will tell you the more you use your muscles, the bigger the bones grow. It's a much slower process, but it does happen, okay? Aborigines have a nomadic way of life. They don't want to carry a toolbox with them, so they make their tools on the spot, and they're always using their jaws like a vice. But what happened to the Aborigines in Tasmania and Australia, you will not be able to understand what happened and why it happened until you see how evolution tied in. These two folks used to go collect skulls for museums. This article says, uh, the new South Wales missionary was the horrified witness to the slaughter by mounted police of a group of dozens of Aboriginal men, women, and children. Forty-five heads were then boiled down and the best ten skulls packed off for overseas. The Smithsonian today has 33,000 sets of human remains in their basement as evidence for evolution. And I think part of this is from the theory that it's, it's destructive. There was 1904, St. Louis uh, held the World's Fair. 2,000 primitive people were put on display to demonstrate the superiority that white Americans had evolved farther. Anthropologist McGee designed the display. Peter Jennings told about it here in his book, Century for Young People, of ABC, by ABC Peter Jennings. Oda Bengo was taken away from his wife and two kids and put in a cage with chimpanzees to demonstrate the, how the, he was an African pygmy. The guy went insane and killed himself. That was part of a demonstration for evolution. See the website rae.org if you want more on that. Theodore Roosevelt believed in evolution. He thought the Indians were an inferior species. Roosevelt said, I wish the wrong people could be prevented entirely from breeding. He thought the many immigrants from Europe, Scotland, Ireland, and the Orient were a threat to American society. I don't think you'll understand what happened to the Indians until you understand the theory of evolution how it was prevalent during the 1800s. The Trail of Tears, which took place before Darwin's book came out, but evolution was popular before Darwin's book came out. Those people came right across this part of Arkansas. One third of the Cherokees died on the way. Um, Sam Houston was enraged by what happened to them. He quit Congress over it. Um, you won't understand the uh, Trail of Tears incident until you understand they thought they were an inferior species. Yet the Bible says we all are of one race. Evolution is also certainly the foundation for communism. Communism is based on evolution theory 100%. Uh, the founder of the ACLU, the American Communist Lawyers Union, <laughs> said communism is the goal. Karl Marx, the founder of communism, wrote a beautiful paper of how much he loved the Lord when he was 17, but he went off to college and a professor destroyed his faith in first year in college. Karl Marx uh, was one of many whose faith has been destroyed in one year of college from Christian homes. 75% of the kids from Christian homes who go to secular schools will lose their faith after one year in college. Marx later said, my objective in life is to dethrone God and destroy capitalism. Professor uh, Wilson at Harvard University said, as were many persons from Alabama, I was a born-again Christian. When I was 15, I entered the Southern Baptist Church with great fervor and interest in the fundamentalist religion. I left at 17 when I got to the University of Alabama and heard about evolution theory. Uh, we could go all day on this one, uh, this topic. Let's see. Evolution is not only the foundation for racism and communism. Adolf Hitler and Mussolini were strong believers in evolution. This is what motivated them to do what they did. Hitler thought the Germans were the superior race. Uh, Sir Arthur Keith wrote the foreword to Darwin's book when it was republished in 1959, the 100-year anniversary edition. 
He said, the German Fuhrer has consistently sought to make the practice of Germany conform to the theory of evolution. Um, a direct line runs from Darwin through the father of eugenics movement, Darwin's cousin, Francis Galton, to the extermination camps of Nazi Europe. Here's Hitler's book, Mein Kampf. It's full of his racist philosophy, where he talked about higher and lower races. What motivated Adolf Hitler to do what he did was this theory that there is a higher and a lower race. Hitler thought the blonde-haired, blue-eyed Norwegians were close to pure Aryan. They were the superior race. The Germans were second. They were mostly Aryan. Mediterraneans are slightly Aryan. Slavic, half Aryan, half ape. Oriental, slight ape. Black African, mostly ape. And Jewish, close to pure ape. You will not understand what happened with Hitler in World War II and 13 million people being executed, not just the ones at the camp, but in the, in the whole war. 13 million people lost their life because of this uh, evolution theory. When the Olympics were held in Berlin, Germany, 1936, Jesse Owens won the most gold medals and Hitler refused to shake his hand. Hitler walked out of the stadium because he thought he was an inferior animal. Uh, we could talk a long time about that, but I don't think it's possible to understand what happened uh, how, to history without tying in this evolution theory. It is not just a dumb idea, it's a dangerous religion, and we cover that quite a bit in our videotape number five. A couple more things you mentioned in my one minute I have left here. Get all my notes here. Well, you mentioned there's a flat earth society. What, why on earth would you bring up such a dumb idea as that? I'm not a member of a flat earth society. The Bible says very clearly the earth is round. What you're doing here is trying to, it's another fallacy in logical argument. I have to get my list of all the 80 different possible fallacies you can do in arguing, but that was another one of them. Guilt by association is what it boils down to. The Bible says very clearly in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 22, that the Lord sits on the circle of the earth. Okay, so for you to say the uh, earth is uh, flat, <laughs> it's ridiculous, okay? The Hebrew word used there is sphere. As far as germ therapy theory, I think there's overwhelming evidence uh, that uh, germs are involved in the in disease, but it is called disease th the germ theory because surprisingly, there, there's still a, a, quite a bit of argument about it. Okay, people, the, a disease, a, a germ can be infested in a room, and some people will get it, some people won't. For instance, if you are taking oregano oil or garlic tablets, anthrax won't, doesn't seem to affect you. So does the anthrax cause the disease or does the lack of resistance cause the disease? Does oxygen cause rust or does exposed metal cause rust? I mean, all you have to do is paint the metal and it won't rust. So I, I would agree there's a germ theory and a cell theory and all this stuff, but for you to try to associate evolution with it is a, is a logical fallacy. And there is no evidence for evolution. I would like you to share with the audience what is the best known evidence for any animal changing to a different kind of animal. What's the best evidence? Just give me the best one, okay? Save us a lot of time. I contend there is none, and I would quickly point out again that no fossil evidence could possibly count because you can't prove it had any kids. So that wouldn't work as evidence for evolution. Please tell us your best evidence for evolution. Thank you. What did you say? A kind? A kind? Yeah. The Bible says those that originally were able to bring forth, obviously the bringing forth it determines whether it's a kind or not. Now there may be very variations now, 6,000 years later, where they can no longer bring forth because of you know, Great Dane and Chihuahua have a few mechanical problems, but they could still actually bring forth, uh, technically. So I'm not sure exactly where the original created kind was, where the boundaries are. And if I were asking the taxpayers to pay for my religion to be taught, the burden of proof would be on me to demonstrate where this is. I'm not asking the taxpayers to do that. You're asking the taxpayers to pay for your religion to be taught, so the burden of proof is on you today, not me. There was a... Uh, thank you. Go ahead. <laughs> Well, I was down at uh, Heritage Baptist, this is Heritage Baptist, sorry, at uh, Central Baptist College in, in our fair city of Conway, who, um, and I was looking through uh, the uh, Creation Research Society quarterly and uh, came upon a, a 1997 article by uh, Garcia Pozuela Ramos. Um, I might have gotten the name a little bit wrong, but it's, it's something close to that. And it's 1997 uh, in which he tried to uh, apply definitions of exactly what kinds were and were not uh, specifically to the primates, reviewing various lines of evidence for what created kinds uh, are and how we can define them uh, for um, monkeys and apes. And he mentioned something, and this is there in the library, that he did not do this experiment, and I honestly don't know who did or whose idea it was, but someone tried fertilizing uh, the egg cell of a gibbon, uh, that's a um, so-called lesser ape, uh, with uh, human sperm and uh, they were actually able to get the sperm to penetrate and initiate the beginning stages of uh, fertilization. I don't know if the experiment got any farther than that. 
Uh, frequently, the uh, criterion that is used for defining a kind is interbreeding. And I remember a very entertaining uh, presentation that uh, Dr. Hovind gave last year in which he pointed out that you can interbreed a horse with a donkey, you get a mule, you interbreed a zebra with a donkey, and you get a zonkey, and a zebra with a horse, and you get a zorse, and, um, and so on. Uh, but this, this, you know, the idea that you can at least start the fertilization process between human and gibbon sort of worries me a bit. How would, how would you respond to that? You know, I, I, I don't want to, you know. No, it's fine. Uh, I, I, I prefer much prefer a dialogue rather than, you know, 10 minutes of each. Uh, I don't think you'll find uh, many humans volunteering for this experiment. <laughs> and probably very few gibbons, too. Okay. So it, I would quickly point out this doesn't happen in nature, okay? Secondly, it did not produce a fertile offspring. If there mm -hmm. are similarities in DNA enough to initiate the process, that still means mm -hmm. nothing, okay? Sometimes my computer will try to load a program and then fail. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it did, it's but, not a success. Mm -hmm. But horses and donkeys do not produce fertile offspring uh, well, yes, either. Uh, one out of 20,000 mules is fertile. Oh, oh yeah. all right. It's pretty rare, but it does happen. Hmm. But see, the fact that a horse, a horse and, a, and a jackass and a zebra are probably different, they're certainly different species, mm -hmm. but they're obviously the same kind. I mean, any five-year-old will tell you, they stand back and look, they're the same kind of animal. This is not the same kind as a, as a turtle, for instance, okay? Um, so, um, yeah, the, the, I'm not sure exactly where the kind is, which is what I told you. And if, if, the, if I were asking um, the taxpayers to pay for my religion to be taught, the burden of proof would be on me to demonstrate this. But it, I'm not. All right. Well, on your, um, I confess to still a little bit of, uh, 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 to still a little bit of, um, of confusion here. Um, let me let me see if I can if uh, if I can straighten this out. Um, you mentioned that horses and donkeys perhaps should be considered the same kind because one in twenty thousand mules is uh, is fertile. Uh, since we haven't actually tested, as far as I know, I hope we haven't uh, twenty thousand uh, attempts at cross fertilizing humans and apes. Uh, that's quite obvious to anyone that studies the the number of chromosomes of different animals, which I cover in my seminar. You know. Uh, the chromosome number is, is vastly different, and certainly the length of the chromosome. There are all kinds of things to cause it uh, mm -hmm. problems. It's, it's actually tough enough for human couples. Uh, very frequently, they cannot produce a child because it just takes one little minor problem, and there's a large percentage. I don't, Doctor, maybe you know the percentage of human couples that are infertile. They would love to have babies that cannot. I mean, um, well, there. Um, I, I actually looked this up. Um, looked at uh, chromosome numbers for horses and uh, donkeys. And uh, if memory serves, horses have 64 and donkeys 62. I could have that backwards, but they only differ by, um, uh, by two chromosomes, and yet they are part of one kind because, uh, you know, for the reasons that uh, you've just uh, outlined so clearly. Uh, the problem is that humans have 46 and apes have 48, and the difference is, again, only, uh, only of uh, two chromosomes. Um, so in one case, you have a difference but it's not enough to put uh, horses and donkeys in different kinds. In another case, you have a genetic difference, but it is enough to put humans and apes in, in two different kinds. And I'm not quite sure. I, I, I'm, I'm looking for you know, some sort of logical consistency I can take back to uh, uh, tell my students. Because they, they ask questions like this. They're sure, a no, smart that's, group. That's, that's a fair question. They're yeah. the you know, finest university students in the state, whatever the, those people up in Fayette, whatever it is, uh, may say about the matter. UCA rocks. Uh, the number of, <laughs> number of chromosomes is an interesting study. It is indeed true that chimps have 48, humans have 46. Tobacco also has 48. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> oh. Um, amoebas have 50, and they say we came from an amoeba, yet they've got more chromosomes than we do. Um, Chickens and dogs both have 78. They're identical twins. Um, the fern has the most chromosomes. That's the ultimate goal of all evolution, to become a fern. So um, I think common sense would tell you, if you look through the, uh, you know, the possum, the redwood tree, and the kidney bean, all have 22 chromosomes. Um, the similarities, I think, are evidence of a common designer. Now, if you want to believe that humans and apes have a common ancestor, you're certainly welcome to believe that. Thank you. But that is not something that you should be using taxpayers' dollars to. Certainly, you should not teach it dogmatically. 
And if you teach it at all, you ought to give other alternatives, like, hey, maybe the similarity is because of a common uh, designer as opposed to a common ancestor. Mm -hmm. Okay, the number of... Uh, it certainly could be Allah. I mean, I mean uh, God, sorry, sorry. I don't know what came Yeah, to me. it could be uh, similarity. Let's see. Uh, I've got information on that here someplace. I have over 4,000 pictures, so it really helps if you ask your questions in the same order that I have my answers. That will right, speed things right. up. Right, mm -hmm. All right. I, I actually agree with you about the use of uh, taxpayers' money to, uh, uh, to fund the teaching of uh, fraudulent theories. And you had an excellent solution for this on your website uh, last year. And it, it doesn't seem to, um, uh, to be there now. But at one time, you had a very long explanation uh, about why you did not, in fact, uh, in fact uh, pay uh, federal income tax. And it had to do with federal income tax is not charged to you as a citizen. It's charged to a, a fictional legal corporation um, mm -hmm. that was created by, by, by the government. Yeah, this and is this another. Is, and this is shown because your W-2 forms and things like that have your name in capital letters, which mm -hmm. legally does not refer to you, sure. which would be your name in capitals in lowercase. What you're doing now is another logical fallacy called uh, red herring. You're trying to draw attention away from the argument by focusing on or ad hominem argument, attacking Are you personally. Uh, I have nothing to fear whatsoever for IRS or anything mm -hmm. else. I mean, uh, obviously, they're big boys. Why would you worry about it? You know, they can take right, care of me right, just fine. Right. Um, but I believe everybody should obey the law, including the government. Mm -hmm. And I do. And if you're going to try to uh, accuse me of breaking some law, you need to be better, better be prepared to defend that. Oh, okay. I, I was not accusing you okay. of anything. Yeah, in fact, I, in fact yeah, I, kind of, um, gentlemen. I kind of approve of the idea. Okay. Uh, getting us back on target, we want to sure. allow you a few minutes to, uh, to discourse with each other. But uh, getting back on the subject, we do want to ask more questions. Oh, there we go. Sorry. Is that there right? we go. We, uh, we just whose uh, work I've seen by the name of Ken Ham. I believe he leads uh, Answers in Genesis. Is, mm -hmm. uh, is that right? Yes, good friend of mine. And uh, I believe it was on his website uh, that uh, he gave the suggestion uh, that when a teacher presents the idea that the universe is millions or billions or kajillions or whatever they're up to these days, um, old, uh, that the response is, how do you know? Were you there? I have actually gotten that response from several uh, students of mine in the non-majors biology course I teach when I ask them, do they have any questions? Uh, the response is, how do we, I know, was I there? Well, the answer is, I wasn't. So all I really know is that the universe is um, at least 32 years old. I was there for that portion of it. Uh, the rest of it is complete speculation. I was not there for, oh, the Civil War, the Revolutionary War. Uh, all we have is indirect evidence for things like that, but we don't have direct demonstration that any things like this happened. Uh, so I'll just say that uh, I definitely know it's older than 32 and leave it at that. Thanks. All right, very good. Uh, and I can testify it's at least 49. Oh. Oh. I think the type of evidence we have for the Civil War is vastly superior to the type of evidence we have for evolution, OK? Oh. We have no evidence of evolution happening in the present. We have no, ev no proof of it happening in the past. Uh, it's something people believe in. And that's a religious worldview. And it should not be taught at taxpayer expense. Uh, I thought the question was leading to uh, evidences that the for the age of the universe? OK. Typically, the most common uh, given are, at least for the age of the Earth, are radiometric dating methods, be it carbon dating, potassium argon, rubidium strontium, lead 208, whatever. It uh, doesn't matter. They're all based on the same assumptions. We cover that in our video number seven in great detail. Uh, living mollusk shells, for instance, were carbon dated at 2,300 years old. Obviously, they're not 2,300 years old. They're still alive. Freshly killed seal, carbon dated 1,300 years old. They had just killed it. Okay, It's not 1,300 years old. Shells from living snails, carbon dated 27,000 years old. I mentioned this earlier. One part of a mammoth is 29,000, another part's 44,000. Baby Dima was dated at 40,000, another part's 26,000, and the wood next to it is 9,000. If you get the Geological Survey Professional Paper 862, you will find a rather interesting reading, kind of tough to wade through, but I've got the paper at home. Here it says sample number 454 is 17,000 years old. Sample 455 is 24,000 years old. But if you read, it says this is the same sample as 454. Interesting. 
Sample number 299 is less than 20,000 years old. Sample L137X is greater than 28,000, and yet it's the same sample as 299. You go through and you wade through this and you find out they simply do not know, okay? Um, we could talk a long time about carbon dating. The other one commonly used is uh, the idea that the universe is billions of years old because of the stars, you know, being so-called billions of light years away. The stars may indeed be billions of light years away. I would never argue that they're not, but I certainly would argue that we do not know that the speed of light has been a constant. I also would argue we cannot prove the distance to the stars. They probably are billions of light years away, but we, d we can't measure beyond about 100 light years. And you don't know, we don't know what light is, okay? Um, at Harvard University in 1999, they slowed light down to 38 miles an hour. The next year, they slowed it down to one mile an hour. The next year, they brought it to a full stop. The speed of light was brought to zero done at Harvard University and Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics and also done at Cambridge. At Princeton University, they speeded light up to 300 times the speed of light. Um, speed of light has decreased rapidly in the observable time span. Here's a chart showing the decline of the speed of light. Uh, we could talk a long time about that. Here's a couple of quick quotes here. The speed of light was apparently exceeded by a factor of as much as 100 in two published experiments. Uh, the speed of light was 10 billion times faster at time zero uh, speed of light may have changed over history, the study says. This is August of 2001. Now we've got the entire article here if you'd like to read that. Um, the shocking possibility is the speed of light might change in time during the life of the universe. So I think we do not know that the speed of light has always been consistent. So typically the most common arguments for a great age for the universe are the speed of light, you know, the distance to the stars, and the uh, radiometric decay. Now, it doesn't matter which radiometric decay you use, be it potassium argon, rubidium strontium, lead 208, lead 20, you know, it doesn't matter. Um, they're all based on obvious assumptions. 80% of potassium in a small sample can be removed by distilled water in four and a half hours. Um, you mentioned skull, uh, KNMER1470. Uh, Richard Leakey found this skull in 1972. Before he found it, the KBS tuff had been dated by many methods at being 212 million years old. When Leakey's uh, famous KNMER1470 -E, KNM -E skull was found in 1972 under the KBS tuff, it really caused quite a ruckus in the paleontolo paleontological community because um, you can't have a human skull that old. So they quickly decided, well, we must have misdated the KBS tuff. Even though it had been dated many times before, including Nature Magazine, April 18, 1970, they said the KBS stuff is 212 to 230 million years old. Richard Leakey finds a perfectly or relatively normal human skull, and obviously a skull, under the KBS tuff. Well, they said it uh, can't be, something's wrong here. So they redated the KBS tuff. It took 10 samples, and now the numbers range from 0.5 to 2.6. That's a 500% error. Your Honor, I don't think they know. Uh, we mentioned how the age of the Earth uh, has been inflated down through years, you know, going from 70,000 to uh, now current 4.6 billion. The Earth is getting older, 21 million years per year. Um, basalt from Mount Etna in Sicily was potassium argon dated at a quarter million years old, yet they knew the lava flow was just shortly before the time of Christ. Hawaiian lava flow, 1801, was potassium argon dated at 1.6 million years old. It's only 200. Uh, Mount, uh, however you pronounce that, in Hawaii, was 8.5 million years old from a 1959 lava flow. Uh, Mount Etna in Sicily, I climbed Mount Etna. Um, they dated 70, 700,000 years old. Here's another one from 300,000. The new lava dome in Mount St. Helens, 1980 eruption. The new lava dome was built over the next few years. Lava samples were taken fresh and they gave ages of anywhere from 0.35 million, that's 350,000, to 2.8 million for lava that is brand new. So when you date a sample of known age, it doesn't work. When you date a sample of unknown age, it is assumed to work. <laughs> so we have God's word that the world was made in six days, about 6,000 years ago. We have God's word that tells us there was no death until Adam sinned. We have human records going back about five or 6,000 years maximum. Uh, we have many examples of uh, geologic features that are simply indicating the universe cannot be billions of years old. Erosion rates of mountains, for instance, indicate that at the current erosion rate, the mountains will erode flat in 14 million years. 
And yet they tell us we have fossils that are 300 times older than that, still above sea level. They should have been recycled, washed out to sea 300 times at the current rate of erosion that we observe. Um, we observe all sorts of physical uh, factors that tell us, that, that put limits on the age of the universe. And I think I would just as soon trust God's word until it's proven wrong, as opposed to doubt God's word until it's proven right. So that's my position. Coexisted, uh, which is uh, accurate. Dr. Warren, we'll start with you. Right. A couple of years ago, I visited uh, the Creation Evidences Museum in uh, Glen Rose, Texas, uh, just outside the uh, boundaries of Dinosaur Valley State Park, um, which uh, includes the bed of the Paluxy River, which is a famous place where dinosaur tracks, uh, including entire trackways, uh, have been found. Uh, this, is a, um, uh, this is a very famous uh, uh, location in the creationist uh, uh, literature. This museum was set up to demonstrate uh, human footprints and even human trackways uh, that had been found there. And for a while, um, you know, it was featured in documentaries like The uh, Mysterious Origins of Man and uh, things of that nature. Uh, the problem is, I'm confused here again, uh, recently, the uh, Institute for Creation Research, based out in uh, Southern California, in the San Diego area, um, issued, an, uh, uh, issued a report on the uh, human tracks from the Paluxy River uh, in, which, um, uh, in which they argued that they were not actually human tracks. They were either more or less chance uh, depressions in the rock that happened to look like a track, uh, or in some cases, uh, they were produced by humans, but not with feet, uh, with chisels. There's a couple of those that uh, appear to be suspicious in that regard. And there's others that appear to be dinosaur tracks that have weathered in an odd way. And uh, this, was not, uh, this was not the conclusion of the evolutionary establishment. Uh, this was John Morris, uh, son of the uh, well-known uh, creationist Henry Morris, who wrote several of the books on that table. Uh, so recently, they've had to uh, withdraw uh, some of the evidence for dinosaurs and uh, uh, and humans walking to um, uh, walking together. Um, on the other hand, uh, Dr. Carl Bau, who operates the um, operates the museum right there, is uh, certainly convinced of their reality. He has uh, what's well, it looked to me like a rock, but he told me it was a fossil human finger, and he's got a PhD. Who am I to doubt him? Uh, uh, so clearly there is, there is um, you know, argument on both sides within the creationist camp, and I'm not quite sure what I should teach other than that I should probably present you know, the idea that humans and dinosaurs coexisted and that they didn't, and um, leave the students free to make up their own minds. But that's really all I know on the topic, and I'm sure Dr. Hovind will enlighten you uh, further. I would be honored to do such a thing. Wonderful. <laughs> Uh, it's pretty clear known biological fact that reptiles grow all their life. They simply never stop growing. And there's a long technical reason for why with the you know, growth plates at the end of the bones, etc. Reptiles grow all their life. So if a reptile were allowed to live to be eight or 900 years old, it would, actually, it would be gigantic, okay? Um, the word dinosaur means terrible lizard. Uh, that's what the word means. And I believe dinosaurs were giant reptiles in the reptilian family from the pre-flood times when people were living to be 900 years old. Dr. Um, Cabrera, I should be a C, um, here is holding a human vertebrae found with dinosaur bones in Peru. Dr. Cabrera also has a lot of interesting evidence on uh, dinosaurs and humans living together based on the Ica stones. Uh, I have three in my collection in Pensacola, Florida, three originals. About 50,000 of these stones have been found. There are 15 in the United States. Dr. Baugh, who you mentioned, has one. Uh, Dennis Swift has two. Um, these stones clearly depict dinosaurs. The footprints you're talking about from Glen Rose, Texas, I've been there three times. Um, the limestone layers there are pretty interesting. When it uh, weathered and uh, eroded, eroded rapidly in, in 1908 in the flood, a two-foot layer of limestone was peeled off and moved downstream about 20 miles. They found the fragments that were peeled off, some pieces as big as a van. Underneath were thousands of dinosaur footprints. So they made Dinosaur Valley State Park. It is still there today. It costs five bucks to get in. Well worth going to see. 
go in July or August, and you're probably going to have the river dry, and you can walk in the footprints much easier. Uh, during the 30s, in the Depression, the sandbags uh, were set up to block off part of the river. It's not a very deep river normally, a couple of feet. And they pumped out areas, and they chiseled out large blocks of tracks to save them in museums. American Museum of Natural History got a large block of tracks and built a dinosaur on top of it. Here's Thomas, Tom Penley, the famous photo of him sitting in the dinosaur footprint. Roland Byrd is the one who was in charge of excavating the tracks in 1930. He was American Field Museum explorer. He said he saw clearly defined human footprints with the dinosaur tracks. 15 to 20 inch long human footprints. Dr. Daughtery was a chiropractor in Glen Rose for 17 years. I met him and talked to him. He spent thousands of hours measuring, documenting all this stuff on human footprints, knowing being a chiropractor, he understands a little bit about the biomechanics of walking, and said they are clearly um, human footprints. That was after his 17 years of research. I don't know if your couple days down there was uh, equivalent to that, but um, there are thousands of dinosaur footprints found. They're not hard to find. Dinosaur footprints are found everywhere. Back in 1884, Earl Flint, a geologist representing the Peabody Museum, was working in a rock quarry in uh, Nicaragua and found fossilized human tracks 16 to 24 feet below the surface. He describes the whole thing in his book here in 1884. We won't take time to read it all, but there were barefoot as well as well-defined sandal-footed impressions, supposedly over 200,000 years of age. Now, Mr. Flint is all confused because his evolutionary teaching at Harvard University has destroyed, I think, the logical thinking process where you can't, you're not allowed to think outside of the evolutionary box as opposed to, hey, maybe these creatures uh, made these footprints in, in, in the flood, okay? He says, the sandals appear to have been designed both uh, for comfort and protection. 1882, inmates at Carson City, Nevada found several human tracks, 18 to 20 inches long, footprints of a giant. Okay, all this is in uh, Earl Flint's uh, testimony here. Here's a photograph of the tracks. You can get the website omniology.com if you want more on that. These are the human tracks with the person standing here crossing a set of dinosaur tracks. The pictures are in the church over there if you want to go look at them. Um, Dr. Daughtery is the one who took these photographs of human footprints. You need to understand there's a catch-22 situation here. We don't need to find human and dinosaur tracks together. If a few dinosaurs are still alive, that would, that would solve the problem completely. No one has ever found human and chicken footprints in the same rock strata together. Does that prove humans and chickens did not live at the same time? No, it probably proves that humans don't normally hang out with chickens. Okay? So I don't think we need to find the footprints together, number one. Number two, I think they have been found nonetheless. Okay? Texas Tracks and Artifacts is a book. It's $10, bucks, 9 dollars 950 dealing with all the latest evidence on the human and, and dinosaur footprints together. I've been there myself and walked in them. That's a casting of one that I have taken directly out of the river from Glen Rose, Texas. It's a size 24. A uh, good size of people today with a size 24 shoe. That's not the big deal. I mean, it's pretty big. but. Um, the footprints have been analyzed. I think they're legitimate. Um, the reason ICR withdrew their support, and I was with John Morris yesterday. He's a good friend of mine. Um, at, I, I love ICR and what they do. He wrote a book called Tracking Those Incredible Dinosaurs, and then he withdrew the book from publication or from sale because one of the footprints that was uh, real clearly a human footprint at first, when it was first discovered, as it eroded away, uh, it grew two more toes and became a three-toed dinosaur footprint. When the footprint was first found, it was about eight inches deep. Are you trying to, I got to post a stand so you can get this on film. It was about eight inches deep in the rock um, as the erosion destroyed it. Okay? When it was first discovered, you could actually see the dermal ridges. That's the toes equivalence of fingerprints. Okay? You could see them very clearly on the toes. This was obviously a footprint. But over the first six months or so, this begins to erode away once it's exposed, you know. You have a catch-22 situation. If you leave the rock and the footprint where it is, it'll be destroyed by weathering. If you take it out, the skeptics will say, how do we know you got it from the river? So, you know, if you take it out and put it in a museum to preserve it, now they don't believe you. And if you leave it there, it gets destroyed and they don't believe you. Because the bottom line is, they don't want to believe. Doesn't matter what you showed them, okay? So, one of the best footprints uh, that everybody came and witnessed, and lots of folks have testified and written affidavits saying, look, I saw this thing, okay? It was there. As it eroded away, it became a dinosaur footprint, three-toed dinosaur track. And they, somebody said, well, maybe the center part that you thought was a human footprint five years ago was actually just the pad on the bottom of a dinosaur footprint. We don't know if they had pads or not, but maybe they did. Okay. Well, another obvious explanation might be 
The human stepped in the same footprint after the dinosaur was there. The mud squeezed in, obscured the outer toes of the dinosaur. As it eroded away, it exposed those two toes that were there all along. So it was both footprints all along. I talked to John Morris and I said, Dr. John, why did you withdraw your support of this footprints? I've been there three times. I've walked in them. He said, listen, I'm not saying they're not real. And I kind of suspect they are. Dwayne Gish, one of the founders of ICR, 82-year-old, his wife died two weeks ago, a very good friend of mine, he writes lots of books on uh, creation evolution. He has been there numerous times, and he and Henry Morris differ on this. Henry Morris takes the more, and John Morris take the more conservative stance and say, well, we're not really positive. We can't prove it, so let's just not mention it. Dwayne Gish says, look, I've been there. I'm, I'm convinced. So John Morris did not say, we don't believe they're legitimate. He just said, we can't be positive. So it's, he's erring on the side of caution. So it would not be correct for you to say, ICR has said they are not footprints. Don't say that. You can say they have withdrawn dogmatic support of this, but they have never said they're not human footprints, okay? And most of the people, many of the people at ICR, Institute for Creation Research, still think they are indeed legitimate footprints. But my point is, it doesn't matter. We don't need to find dinosaur and foot, human footprints together because dinosaurs have always lived with man. They were known as dragons throughout most of history. Uh, and there's probably a few still alive. In the Congo Swamp, for instance, there have been many reports of dinosaurs still living in Likwala Swamp. Uh, Mr. Scotland, uh, who was uh, moving to Arkansas, by the way, he was in the bodybuilder contest, you know, right next to me. Uh, uh, <coughs> William Gibbons is a good friend of mine. He and I wrote a book together called Claws, Jaws, and Dinosaurs. William Gibbons has been to the Congo Swamp uh, three times and once to Cameroon, where there are reports of dinosaurs still living. Ever since Congo was colonized by Belgium back in 1885, there were reports of dinosaurs still living in that swamp, small ones, 15 or 20 feet long. This article, 1910, New York Herald, talks about a dinosaur still living. 1948, Saturday Evening Post. 1980, a big game hunter went there back in the early 1900s and said he saw an animal that could only fit the description of a dinosaur. There could be dinosaurs by Ivan T. Sanderson. Okay? Roy Mackle's been there three times. Uh, then they report dinosaurs called Mokele and Bembe, small ones, still alive in the swamp right now. So I think there's a fairly good amount of evidence that there could be a few stragglers still around. Eugene Thomas, missionary, was there, a friend of mine. He's in Ohio now, retired. He was for 42 years in the swamp as a missionary. He said, oh yeah, I had two pygmies in my church that killed one and ate it. Uh, for sake of time here, since they're giving me the one-minute warning, uh, I'll just try a couple of other examples. We've got plenty here. 1925, this animal washed up on the beach in California. That's the head. Here's the mouth. Here's the eyeball. Here's the neck. I talked to the guy who wrote this book, uh, Randall Reinstead. I said, Randall, can I get those pictures? He said, you know, those were in the archives at Berkeley University. I went and got, checked out the pictures, wrote my book. I got so many articles about this saying, wow, write more on this. I went back to get the pictures and they, they, they said, we don't have any pictures like that. And they have no record of them ever having had them. They disappeared. Who knows what happened? But the neck on this creature was 20 feet long. One atheist wrote me a letter and said, Hovind, you're so stupid. Don't you know that was a whale? I wrote back and said, just exactly where is the neck on a whale? The people who examined it, like uh, Mr. Wallace, who was the president of the Natural History Society for British Columbia, he was there, stood there, examined the thing. Here's what he said. My examination of the monster was quite thorough. It had no teeth. Its head is large, the neck 20 feet long. The body is weak and the tail only three feet in length from the end of the backbone. With the bill like it possesses, it must have lived on herbage and undoubtedly inhabited a swamp. I would call it a type of plesiosaurus. So I've done an enormous amount of research on dinosaurs that might still be alive. So I think uh, the man and dinosaurs together to a creationist is, is not a problem. If there aren't any alive, it wouldn't bother me. But I think there's good evidence they have lived with man all through history. They were known as dragons through most of history. 1841, we changed names and now call them dinosaur. Thank you. At the beginning of this debate, I made some statements about what I was going to do in my evolution class. I stand by those. They're the way I've always taught my course. I don't believe I have the power to brainwash my students into abandoning their faith. If I did have that power, well, what I would brainwash them into doing would be my stack of dirty dishes, um, which is more important than I get done uh, than the other alternative. I have I used to ask questions like this, but for the past three years when I've taught evolution, I simply have not asked students whether they believe it or not. And the reason is that belief in the religious sense 
uh, the assuredness of things unseen and Paul's uh, definition thereof is simply not the issue in a science class. And I teach evolution in a science class. I do not particularly care whether they accept it or not. I've had people you know, come up to me with the attitude that um, they seem to think that for every 10 people I convert to the cause of evolutionism, I get another piece of free luggage or something like that. Uh, well, I don't. It does not make any difference to me. I have had students come in with very strong religious beliefs. They've shared them uh, with me in some cases. Others have not. Um, some of them are theistic evolutionists. They're willing to accept evolution but believe God was guiding the entire process. It's not my place to tell them they're wrong any more than it's my place to tell them that they can only baptize individuals as babies by sprinkling. That's not what I'm paid to make decisions about. I don't care if they believe it or not. They are free if they wish to, to treat the entire class as an enormous fiction. What I do demand that they do is they understand the material. And I will stand by this. My students may or may not believe in evolution, but if they've listened, and if they've absorbed what I have to say, and if they understand the reasoning that I use, they understand it better than Dr. Hovind. And that's not very difficult. The fact that the statement you made that we never see stars formed is false. The Hubble telescope has caught them in various stages of formation. Changes of three nucleotides is fatal to the organism. In certain genes, perhaps it can be. There are other genes that can change in a great many ways without affecting organismal function at all. Mutation rates that have been observed in natural populations are much higher than that. Darwin was a racist. Well, find me somebody living in the 19th century in England who wasn't. And I will agree that Darwin's ideas and evolution in general have been put to a lot of racist uses. So has the Bible. If you want to ban evolution because it's been the inspiration for racism, uh, would the next step be to ban the cross because it's been used as a symbol by uh, those losers in bedsheets who uh, go around setting it on fire? I don't think so. There is a difference between the way you use a theory, an idea, a principle, a religion, and what it actually says. And Darwin was not PC by modern standards. Nobody was PC by modern standards. If you cut all the racists out of history, uh, you would pretty much have to get rid of just about all 18th and 19th century history and literature. He was ahead of his time in a number of ways, believing, for example, that um, uh, passionately opposed to slavery, uh, Stephen Jay Gould, whom you cited in support of your position, has written entire books on how evolution really does not support racism. What it supports is, as you said, the unity of humankind, that we are all of one family, we are all of one species, we are all descended from a common ancestor. That's Gould's position. That's the position of most. See here, some of the human evidence you mentioned, Nebraska man and Piltdown man, those are not seriously being taught uh, as evidence for or against human evolution. And the reason is, Science is constantly shifting. Science is constantly changing. All too often, science is taught as a set of facts that you just sort of memorize, spit back out on the paper, and then you're finished. Science is not that. Science is not the facts any more than a house is just a pile of bricks. Science is a constantly renewing process. Uh, We've seen some examples of this, about the uh, heckle being brought up on uh, court charges for falsifying certain of his drawings. Uh, what Kent didn't tell you was that uh, later versions of uh, the same drawings were considerably more accurate. And I say this because I've checked them against actual embryos. Uh, he talked about um, inaccuracy of radiometric dates. And I teach my students about these. There are plenty of things that can screw up a radiometric date. There are plenty of reasons you could get a wrong answer. There are also plenty of ways that we cross-check radiometric dates and can assess their accuracy, and when they don't seem to work, can find physical reasons why they don't operate. We can find physical reasons why they've gone wrong. If your clock or if your watch suddenly said it was uh, 1047 in the morning right now, you probably wouldn't conclude that our entire system of timekeeping is utterly flawed. You'd assume that something had gone wrong with your watch, something quite ordinary, 
the same thing exactly can take place in rocks. Well, exactly, except it doesn't involve gears and things like that. Um, but the same processes can be affected, but we can tell when they have been. I teach my students that radiometric dating is not 100% accurate. I mention its fallacies, I mention its flaws, and I mention the ways that we can correct for this sort of thing. My last statement is this. Uh, Arkansas Bill 2548 was put out to eradicate inaccuracies, theories, suppositions, etc., cetera, uh, and unproven ideas, religions, as Dr. Hovind says, from, uh, uh, from textbooks that are purchased with taxpayer money. Even a really good textbook is about five years behind the time, sometimes quite a bit more. Sometimes publishing companies don't update. Any textbook that you purchase, whether it deals with evolution or anything else, is going to have a certain number of oversimplifications and flaws and inaccuracies and things that we now know are wrong, sometimes because they're not written well, sometimes because they're just copying older versions, and sometimes because they haven't caught up, uh, caught up with the new science. Uh, Dr. Hovind's presentations on human evolution have not caught up with the new science because I can think of about six or seven new fossil forms that have been found that have some bearing on where humans came from. Even though he says that, hum that fossils provide no evidence for evolution, that's like saying gravestones provide no evidence uh, for history. And so if you support this law, you might as well ban all textbooks right now because science is not merely a set of facts that you memorize and then get rid of. It's a constantly changing field. It's a constantly changing way of thinking, of coming up with reasonable approximations to the truth and then discarding them when they don't work and coming up with something else. And evolution, regardless of what Dr. Hovind says, is very much a part of that tradition. We are constantly revising we are constantly updating. We are constantly tossing out bad and putting in better. We haven't absolutely proved it yet. We haven't absolutely proved anything. You will never prove anything absolutely anywhere in science. Uh, it was shown by the logician Karl Popper in the 1930s. You cannot get absolute proof. What you can get is what you can all right, you're putting up the uh, stop sign, so let me see if I can finish this in, a, um, in an orderly fashion. Uh, what you can get are better approximations uh, to the truth that is, in fact, out there. Evolution is very much a part of this growing process. Evolution is as sound a science as anything you are going to find. And while I don't demand that my students accept it, and I don't demand that they surrender their faith, my goal as a teacher is to give them a sense of this dynamic nature of how it changes and how it grows and how it improves. Thank you very much. There we go. Well, I'm glad to hear that uh, you admit science is constantly changing and improving and progressing. Uh, when you get all done climbing the mountain of truth, you will find the Baptists were sitting there all along. <laughs> and uh, you mentioned about improving the accuracy of the drawings. Uh, let me make sure I understand what you're saying. These are the drawings that Haeckel used to support the embryology idea. Okay. He flat lied. And it's not an improving of the drawings we need to get, folks. On top are Haeckel's drawings. Underneath are actual photographs. Now, if you try, it appeared to me like you tried to imply in your last statement that this might still be evidence for evolution because now we have more accurate drawings. I hope you're not implying that because everybody that studies this will tell you it's been disproven a long time ago. The biogenetic law, as Haeckel called it, can, cannot be weeded out in spite of its having been demonstrated to be wrong by subsequent scholars. The biogenetic law is as dead as a doornail, okay? There is no evidence for this. Haeckel was convicted of fraud and confessed he was a liar. Go ahead. Uh, that's, that's why I don't teach the biogenetic law the way Haeckel Good. proposed it. It just sounded to me like... I don't know anybody who does teach that ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. Okay, you bring that me doesn't the... mean that this isn't... In, this doesn't mean that this isn't evidence. Okay, 
But it, there you go again. It doesn't mean it isn't evidence. How can you say that? The bio, it's, a, it's a dead law. No, but here you are still clinging to it, claiming it is still evidence. That's, is anybody else getting that? Is that what he's implying? Yeah. All right. Ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny was Heckel's particular spin in which he argued that an organism literally goes through its ancestral stages on the way to becoming an adult. That Correct. at one time you were, in some important sense, a fish, you had gills, etc. Well, they're not gills. I don't teach that they're gills. The textbooks that I use call them pharyngeal slits rather than right. gills. I agree. Do you still teach mm -hmm. that this is evidence for evolution, though? What? The bi ontogeny recapitulating no. phylogeny? Do, do you still teach that the embryo goes through stages of evolution? Um, I don't know anybody who does right now, and bring, I certainly bring don't. Bring me the textbook used in your, your college. I'll show it to you. Uh, I actually teach mostly from uh, PowerPoint presentations on the web. Um, okay. I'm not very good at following um, well, good. textbooks. But I guarantee it is still in the books, that. and that's what the folks are upset about. Get that out of the books. It's a mm -hmm. lie. Take it out of the books. Mm -hmm. they, don't, they don't want to pay to cut down more perfectly good trees to print perfectly mm -hmm. bad lies. Right. If memory serves, the textbook we used didn't include the biogenetic law. I, what it I did point out was that... Um, I collect the textbooks. I have hundreds of them. I assure you, it's in there. In uh, Monroe Strickberger? I don't, have, I don't know if I have that particular one. I have uh, hmm. probably a couple of dozen. My point is, it's still in there. Here's an Irish textbook telling the embryo is gill slits. Here's Holt Biology showing gill slits. That's simply a lie. Here's Glencoe Biology showing gill slits. A fourth week embryo. Here's uh, Tim Barra still teaching 115 years after it was proven wrong. Here's Kenneth Miller, 1998. I debated Ken Miller on the radio a couple of months ago. I said, Ken, why are you still teaching that? You write a lot of textbooks. He said, well, we're taking it out of the next edition. Here's a 2000 edition textbook, still has the gill slits. Here's a 2001 textbook, still teaching the kids. They look similar. These similarities provide evidence that these animals evolved from a common ancestor. Now that's just a bald-faced lie. First place, they're not similar. Any similarities that there may be construed could be just as much evidence of a common designer. Why are we all, why are we all paying to teach the kids this is evidence of a common ancestor in the 2001, proven wrong in 1874? And I still don't think you get it from what I'm hearing you say. You still somehow think this is evidence for evolution. Do you think the similarities of the embryos are evidence of a common ancestor? Yes or no? Sure. Okay, then you're lying to your kids. They are not evidence of a common ancestor. All right. Cover what are they? Then what are the pharyngeal clefts doing there? That's part of the development process. It's like, why are there rivets on the frame of a car? You've got to have it to hold it together, you know? I don't, the fact that we may not understand everything doesn't prove it's proof of a common ancestor. You're still not getting the point. All this might be proof of a common designer. Why wouldn't you be willing to admit that? It just kids, it could be a common designer. But the textbooks don't teach that. And everybody, and I know, that's got a brain in their head resents that. It certainly could be evidence of a common well, tell designer. The that. <laughs> One question. In my current class, I think many of the uh, students are from a uh, Christian background, but I have at least one practicing Muslim in there. Okay. Um, should I tell him privately that it was Allah and everyone else that it was uh, the God of traditional Christian belief? Oh, Allah is certainly not the God of traditional Christian belief. They are very different right. gods, okay? Mm -hmm. All right, in, uh, in, in Turkey, uh, there's actually a rather large uh, creation science movement that's been uh, gathering steam over the past few years, uh, led by this book by a man named Harun Yahya. Um, every so often they send me junk email, which is kind of a pain because it's in Turkish, uh, which I, my, my conversational Turkish is a little bit uh, rusty, you see. Um, but they use essentially the same arguments uh, that I've seen you present, that I've seen others present, in some cases almost the same diagrams, with the exception that where you would write the God of the Bible, they write Allah. How do we decide the difference between those in a scientific manner? Well, I think we're getting way off topic on that. I think when you read the Koran and it tells you clearly you're supposed to execute anybody who won't convert to Islam, right away you ought to have red flags ought to go up and say, we got a dangerous bunch of folks out there, okay? okay. Now, to get, to get back on topic, let me finish my closing comments and uh, then we'll uh, just, I've got to speak again tonight, otherwise I'll stay as late as possible. 
This textbook shows the kids Grand Canyon, and it says, over millions of years, the Colorado River carved out the Grand Canyon from solid rock. That's just simply a lie, okay? It's a fact the Grand Canyon exists, but it's not a fact of how it happened, okay? Uh, there are two interpretations of that. I'm going to cover that tonight. This textbook again says, the Colorado River has cut through layer upon layer of rock over millions of years. Well, now, hold on a second. If you built a dam across the Grand Canyon, that would take a lot of dirt, by the way, but if you did, a giant lake would back up behind you, covering several states. A massive lake would form. There's a huge drainage area. These two red lines indicate what's called the snow line, and this is about a 270-mile view from a satellite. Grand Canyon, the river, Colorado River enters over here and flows downhill through the canyon and comes out back at ground level, even though it's still, it's still going downhill, because the ground loops up and goes back down. It's called the Kaibab Uplift, a massive several hundred mile uplift. As the river enters the canyon, it's 2,800 feet above sea level. It flows downhill at the point where the canyon is the deepest. It's about 8,000 feet, seven or 8,000 feet above sea level, and the river's at 1,800 feet over a one mile drop, a very impressive hole in the ground. I flew over it yesterday. The Grand Canyon is interesting when you ponder it. The top of the canyon is higher than the bottom by over uh, a mile. The river only runs through the bottom. The top is higher than where the river enters the canyon by over 4,000 feet. Rivers don't flow uphill. There is no possible way that river made that canyon. That canyon was, was obviously a washed out spillway from some big lake. They even have a name for it called Grand Lake or um, Hopi Lake are the names for this. The, uh, interrupt one at a time here, please. The rivers uh, that, that uh, come together, when rivers join together, like your Mississippi and your Missouri up here at St. Louis, they very often come in at what's called acute angles, less than 90 degrees. That's typical for river dendrite patterns to come in at angles because they continue flowing the same direction. Now, if you look at Grand Canyon carefully, the rivers on the left side enter at these acute angles, less than 90 degrees. If you look at the right side, you'll see they enter at oblique angles greater than 90 degrees. This is obviously a lake that was draining and the water ran down the dam to hit the channel to run, turn around and go back out. They're called barbed canyons. So it is simply a lie to tell the kids the Colorado River formed Grand Canyon that is not geologically or physically possible. Here's the problem here. Will somebody haul him out, please, and take time to get, uh, you can, well, I'll take questions in a minute, okay? Um, the Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 3, in the last days scoffers would come who would walk after their own lust. Now, the reason people scoff at God's Word is not because there's a scientific reason to do so. Some people don't like that book because it chaps their hide. Okay? Uh, two minutes? Okay. The Bible says the scoffers are going to say, where is the promise of His coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. The scoffers are going to teach a doctrine called uniformitarianism, which is exactly what all of our science is based on today. I taught our science for 15 years. The Bible says these scoffers are willingly ignorant. In the Greek, that means dumb on purpose. <laughs> They're willingly ignorant of two things. Number one, of by the word of God, the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. We cover this on our video number two of what the original creation was like. The scoffers don't want to admit or understand how the earth was created and how God created it by his word. They're secondly, ignorant of the flood. See, they don't want to admit God created the world because then that would mean God owns it. And that might mean there are some rules. Well, guess what? He did and there are, okay? They also don't want to admit there was a flood because that worldwide flood in the days of Noah is proof positive. God has the authority to judge his creation. And he's coming to judge it again whether you like it or not. And Dr. Wagner, my goal in doing these debates is to help students that have to learn this evolution stuff to see the other side. But another very serious goal I have, I want to win you over to the biblical creationist viewpoint. I really do. Now, if you have a scientific reason to reject the Bible, I would like to hear about it. I'd like to see it, okay? So far, I've not seen you show any scientific evidence that want, makes me want to leave my Bible behind and say that evolution has happened. I haven't seen any scientific evidence, and I've studied this intently for many years. I think some people, as I mentioned at the beginning, like the evolution theory because, hey, this is a nice way to get rid of God, and therefore there are no rules, and therefore, you know, I get to do what I feel like doing. 
by just exactly what Peter said, they walk after their lust. There's the bottom line right there, okay? And uh, if, I, I was, if I was gonna invent a God, I would, not want to, I would not invent one that tells me I can't do some things that you like to do. <laughs> we didn't invent the Christian God, we just are trying to obey and do what he says, okay? If you're here today and you're not a Christian, you ought to become one because we're all gonna stand before this God that judged the world once before and he's gonna judge it again coming real soon to a city near you. Thank you so much for coming. We hope you've enjoyed watching this debate on the topic of creation evolution. This is not just an academic subject. Uh, if the creation story is right and God created this world, then we better do what God says. And if you're watching this tape and you're not a Christian, God loves you. He wants you to come to heaven, but He hates your sin. He hates my sin. He won't tolerate any sin in heaven. Since He created the world and He designed it and He owns it, He makes the rules. And His rule is no sin in heaven. Well, we're all sinners, which means we all deserve to go to hell, but Jesus Christ, God Himself in the flesh, died on the cross to pay for your sins and my sins. On February 9, 1969, I prayed and said, Lord, I'm a sinner. Would you please forgive me and save me? And on that day, I got born again into God's family. You can be born again. All you need to do is admit you're a sinner. Admit that you deserve to go to hell. Call upon Jesus Christ to forgive you and save you. He's the only one who can, and He wants to so badly if you'll just ask Him. If you're not sure you're going to heaven, ask the Lord to save you right now. You could just pray a simple prayer like I prayed back in 1969. I just said, Lord, I'm a sinner. Would you please forgive me and save me right now? If you do that, today will be your spiritual birthday. The Bible says you must be born again in John chapter 3. In John chapter 1, it says you get born again. You become a son of God by receiving him. When you receive Jesus Christ, you receive his gift that he died on the cross for you and you receive that for your sins, that's the day you get born into God's family. You become God's child. We have lots of material in our ministry designed to help strengthen your faith in the Word of God and help you grow as a Christian. If you'd like to call or write our office, we'd be glad to send you a catalog. You can get on our website and get lots of information. If you'd like to schedule a debate, I'd be honored to come. Just get my itinerary off my website and find out when I will be in your area. And I'll be glad to come speak at a college, speak at a university, speak at uh, a debate represent the creation side against as many professors as want to get together. We'll take on 10 at a time, that doesn't matter. You see, God's right and evolution is wrong. It's pretty simple. Thank you so much. Please don't hesitate to call us if we can be any help. Do you want to know more about how to combat the godless theory of evolution? Creation Science Evangelism offers four great tools that help strengthen the faith of believers and win the lost to Christ. After 15 years of teaching high school science, Dr. Hoven began Creation Science Evangelism in 1989. We are a ministry that is dedicated to providing tools which will help you combat the evolution philosophy that is destroying the faith of millions every year. The first tool Creation Science offers is their powerful, life-changing video series. Over the last 12 years, well over a million videotapes of Dr. Hoven's seminar have circled the globe. They are reaping a harvest of souls for the kingdom of Christ as well as helping restore the faith of many thousands confused by the evolution propaganda to which they've been subjected. These videos are available in English, Russian, French, Spanish, Japanese, and sign language. The Age of the Earth, first of the seven-part series, teaches that God created the universe about 6,000 years ago in six literal days. Could this be true? Can it be scientifically proven that the Earth is not billions of years old? This tape gives solid scientific evidence that the Earth is young, and that the Bible is scientifically accurate. How did the environment of the original creation differ from ours today? And how would this allow men to live over 900 years? Can Christians have a good explanation for the existence of dinosaurs? Could some dinosaurs still be alive today? These and many more questions are covered in the second and third part of the series. Evolution has permeated public school textbooks with false and fraudulent information. This video exposes nearly 30 lies commonly found in textbooks. Every public school student, teacher, and school board member needs to watch part four of this series. Find out if you have been lied to in your textbooks. 
Discover the terrible difference evolutionary beliefs have made in the past as well as in recent history in our video number five. Dictators throughout time have used their evolution-based philosophies to rationalize their brutal actions. Learn how evolution propaganda is being used today to prepare people for the new world order. This is just a taste of all the information the 17-hour seminar series has to offer. Also available are college courses that expand on the seminars in great detail. For those who can handle a more confrontational atmosphere, our debate series is just for you. I said, now, Mr. Patterson, if you think the tailbone is a vestigial, I, Kent Hovind, will pay to have yours removed. Dr. Hovind has debated a wide range of atheists and evolutionists all over the country. And you're sure to find these 12 debates very exciting. These would be perfect to present to that scientifically minded person who likes to argue their point. Our topical series includes exciting topics like why evolution is stupid, public school presentation, children's video about dinosaurs, the Bible and health, Leviathan, the fire breathing dragon, and many more. Creation Science also offers a variety of visuals like the longevity chart which presents the entire lineage of Adam to Joseph as given in Genesis. It's exciting to see exactly how many generations were alive at the same time. Hundreds of books on a variety of subjects, videos on incredible creatures that defy evolution, t-shirts, fossils and more. Make Creation Science Evangelism the one-stop shopping center for your creation material needs. Our two websites, www.drdino.com and www.dinosauradventureland.com, provide our second tool for evangelism. Drdino.com is packed with lots of information, from charts and graphs to articles and frequently asked questions. This is also where you will find more information on all of the products CSE has to offer. Dinosauradventureland.com is great for the kids. They can play lots of fun games and see unusual rides and activities located at Dinosaur Adventureland in Pensacola, Florida. Thousands visit our sites regularly to gain insight into God's creation. The third tool available to you is the live seminars conducted by Dr. Hovind and his son Eric. Since 1989, Dr. Hovind has held seminars and debates in hundreds of churches, schools and universities in 49 states and 30 foreign countries. His fast-paced, illustrated seminars cover diverse topics, such as evidence for a young earth, how long Adam lived, dinosaurs living with man, where races came from, radiometric dating, and much more. Our fourth tool is the new, exciting Dinosaur Adventureland. Many thousands have come from all across America to visit our museum, creation bookstore, science center, and theme park, where God gets the glory for science. Our unusual swings, rides, and activities each have a science lesson as well as a spiritual lesson. Captivate everyone from age 4 to 94. To order material, find out how to schedule a seminar at your church, or get more information about Dinosaur Adventureland, write to us at Creation Science Evangelism 29 Cummings Road, Pensacola, Florida, 32503. Or call us at 850-479-3466. Or toll free in the U.S., 877-479-3466.